Welcome everyone. It's good to see a full house. Um, we have actually already called the meeting to order. We've called the roll um, and we just came out of an executive session but there is nothing to report. Um, and we have a uh, very exciting um, and first time uh, ceremony to start our meeting with and that's the Civilian Hero Award Ceremony. And I'd ask Chief Carlson to come up and uh, speak and present the award. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate you being here. Um, tonight, the police department and the village wish to recognize three civilians. If uh, Randy, Tony, Bill, if you come up and join me and stand here, please face the crowd. At approximately 12.15 on the afternoon of October 25th, these three civilians heroically came to the aid of a citizen who was being assaulted. Their courage and willingness to intervene prevented a harmful situation from becoming worse. Their bravery prevented further serious injury to the victim, and we wish to salute as our 2017 civilian heroes the following citizens. Mr. Randy Cardwell of Xenia, Ohio. We salute you. Thank you. Ms. Annika Elizabeth Garrett Oni of Yellow Springs, Ohio. We salute you. Mr. William Dyke of Yellow Springs, Ohio. We salute you. The victim and families have asked that the following be read at this presentation. Behold, I send an angel before you to guard you on the way and bring you to the place where I have prepared. We have always known there are angels among us. Oh yes, they are hard to see while we hustle about our daily duties. But when you least expect it, a stranger's act of kindness, a few nice words, or a man jumping out of a tow truck can make your day or save your life. That's what happened on October 26, when Randy, Bill, and Oni saved the three, saved the life of our daughter. We understand there were other angels in the same area who also came to her aid. There are no words we can offer. There is not enough we can say except thank you to all, and thank you Yellow Springs for your help at that terrible moment. We just want to thank you and pray that wherever you go, whatever you do, may your guardian angel watch over you. With great thanks, M and J, parents of the victim. And I have one more note from the victim herself, and this is to Randy. Dearest Randy, I hesitated to write words of gratitude because I can't see how words could possibly capture my appreciation for who you are. I wholeheartedly believe that you saved my life, and I wish I could be there today to give you a big hug, to look you in the eyes, and to tell you from the depth of my appreciation how much your brief presence in my life means to me. You are and will always be an angel to me, Randy. Thank you. What a great way to start the meeting. Thank you so much um, for all you did to help that day. And thanks to our police department and our, our fire and rescue squad also for the work that they did that day also and every day. Uh, moving on to announcements. Uh, Brian, we'll start with you. All right. Uh, I did want to mention a few things. Uh, first of all, um, Probably everybody knows, but the uh, School Forest Festival is this weekend. So you remember you can get your Christmas tree and lots of uh, 
great hot chocolate and other things. It's from uh, 9 to 3 on both the 9th and the 10th. Um, also, I wanted to highlight kind of an update about the active transportation planning process. Uh, we did hear back and uh, we're going to be ready to start that process really soon. Uh, we have a call on December 12th with um, Tool Design, which is our representative, and uh, I want to put out a more I guess an uh, urgent call for those interested in being on the advisory committee for the active transportation plan planning process. Uh, we will probably be starting that um, middle of January, but I'll have more information after next Tuesday. And then uh, last thing I wanted to mention um, was that uh, Wednesday is uh, a special um, fundraiser at the Presbyterian Church to uh, support uh, Puerto Rico, and uh, this is a soup supper. It's from 5.30 to 7.30. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, Brian? Yeah, I'll, I'll read that one in a minute, too. MLS yeah. exhibition. What's that? Mills Lawn. Mills Lawn Exhibition Night is Wednesday. Oh, yes. Okay. Thank you, Patty. Yeah, Mills Lawn Exhibition Night is also Wednesday. And um, then Patty did ask me to announce that uh, our state representative, Rick Perales, will be holding office hours uh, here in Yellow Springs. Uh, he will be here on Thursday, December 21st from 1 to 3 p.m. In the Bryan Center art room, mm -hmm. and he's here to answer questions uh, and cons and talk about concerns uh, related to his position as a state legislator. Thanks, Brian. Um, it's probably the biggest weekend this weekend for the holidays. Um, I encourage all of you to pick up one of the schedules um, that we have at the train station. You can find around town listing everything that's happening. But in addition to the school forest festival on Saturday or on Sunday. We also have the, um, the John Bryan Community Pottery Sale right here at the, uh, at the pot shop on Saturday and Sunday, the Winter Solstice po Poetry Reading at the Glen Helen Building Friday night, and the big event is the Ginger Bread Festival at Mills Lawn um, Saturday starting at 11 to 2, and Santa will arrive at 12 and be there from 12 to 2. There will be horse-drawn carriage rides from 12 to 3, and um, a lot, Mr. Teddy Roosevelt and Mrs. Roosevelt will be there at 11.30. Um, there's a tyke shop for shopping, so there's lots happening. Um, Teddy also Roosevelt or FDR? Teddy Roosevelt. He was actually at the brewery the other night, so I mean, he's in town. I know he's in town. Um, and let's see, and then also on Saturday uh, at Mills Park Hotel, there's going to be, they're going to do a holiday pop-up shop uh, back in the, uh, in the banquet room. And Arts Alive is um, at the Arts Council, Heart, is going to have heart strings at the Arts Council. And there's going to be a holiday pop-up shop at Yellow Springs Brewery on Sunday. And Handel's Messiah at the First Presbyterian Church Sunday night. So it is a, an action-packed weekend. And next week, we don't have a specific date yet. Um, but sometime next week, I would expect midweek, we will be having a groundbreaking um, out at the CBE for the new Cresco facility. So um, we will let you know as soon as we know exactly what that date is. Uh, next we have the consent agenda. We have the minutes of November 6th and the minutes of November 20th, both regular meetings. Um, do I have a motion to approve? So move. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Although you two need to abstain. Well, I guess, what do they do? No, 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 no. Does it adopt. matter? I think you can approve you minutes. Move to adopt. adopt. Adopt, okay. Okay. Um, review of the agenda. Is there anything um, that we want to add on to the agenda? I, I would like to make one suggestion because we have staff member Johnny Burns here, and I think it would be nice if we didn't make him wait until after all of the old business, so I'd like to move new business up in front of old business. I have a few small things to add. Okay, what's that? Okay, I'd like to add a very brief discussion of the housing needs assessment to the old business. Okay. I'd like to add 2018 council retreat planning uh, to new business and um, 
a request from the Environmental Commission to approve a recommendation for a project that um, one of our EC members is doing. What was that again? I'm sorry. The Which? The last thing? Yeah, the last one. Um, a request from Council for the Environmental Commission to um, send a letter of approval for a project that one of the Environmental Commission members is So doing. would that be new business too? Yes. Okay. And then all... Go ahead, Judy. Under new business, uh, we'll be making a, Jerry and I will be making a recommendation for an alternate to the Planning Commission. Okay. And uh, can we add the letter that we received from uh, Glen Helen Association and the Active Transportation Committee? Okay. And Mike Yellow Springs? Well, you really, I mean, it's more about the Clifton, Yellow Springs Clifton connector, right? That's the letter they submitted. Right. So that's, you want to add a discussion of the Yellow Springs Clifton connector? Uh, sure. Under new business? Yeah. Okay. Can, I mean, I appreciate, can somebody maybe ask folks to take their discussion? Thanks. Um, we appreciate everybody, them all being here and celebrating, but it does get a little loud. Um, Karen, okay. one thought on the agenda. We've got a lot of items, so I wondered okay. if we should, when we get to them, put a time frame on, uh, try to start out with a time frame so that we don't go Well, on. if go, we, some of these could drag out pretty if, long, I it think. It sounds like we're starting out with new business first. It sounds like all That's of the fine. new business hopefully can be um, our more introductory items, so hopefully we could keep each of those to say five minutes or something. Okay. Um, okay. Um, petitions and communications? Anything, Brian? Uh, so we had uh, one, which I referred to, uh, that we'll be discussing on the agenda uh, about the uh, Yellow Springs Clifton connector, which included an attachment, uh, which was a resolution that the village of Clifton passed in support of that project. We also had two letters on our table that came from, uh, that came in on Sunday. Um, so I'm not going to talk about them, but they will be on the next, uh, they'll be in the next packet. Okay. Um, public hearings and legislation, first reading of ordinance 2017-42. Um, Judy, let's read this in by um, title only. Yes, this is repealing section 1040.01 utility dispute resolution board establishment authority of the codified ordinances of the ordinances of the village of Yellow Springs, Ohio and enacting new section 1040.01 utility dispute resolution board establishment authority. Can I get a motion please? So moved. Second. Okay. Um, is Patty, Patty or Melissa or one of you? Mm -hmm. Melissa? Um. Yeah, I will, I will at least introduce this and then um, Chris will probably pick it up. Um, so what we had done, um, since the Utility Dispute Resolution Board has just started to um, have meetings and such, um, we very quickly realized that the composition of the board um, was weighted heavily on the staff side versus the citizen side, so we wanted to make that change. We thought that there were going to have to be a few other changes that we were going to have to make, um, but then we uh, we realized after rereading uh, the current codified ordinances that that was fine. So we were going to make more changes, but um, didn't really need to. So the only change to this ordinance is just changing in in the composition. And actually, I had put a um, I had put like a, a brief into the packet about this and then actually my brief can just be thrown out the window because it actually ended up changing at the very last minute. Um, uh, the solicitor um, ended up figuring out that um, the Utility Dispute Resolution Board's composition, um, we wanted it to mirror our um, and I know that there were two different names for it. It used to be called a tax, um, we, we have a tax dispute board for lack of formal term, but in the codified ordinances it's referred to um, if, it, if it dates um, a 2000 date, it was called something else and then anything after that date in 2000-ish 
it was called something different. But we wanted to uh, make sure that the composition of both of those boards mirrored each other. And those were actually, uh, the tax board was actually a three-member board versus a five-member board. So we actually uh, changed it to be a three-member board and mirror that tax board because the thought was that we would have the same people, uh, the same people serving on both boards. So this way, um, it's not weighted towards staff, which it was three staff members and two citizens. Um, so now it would be, uh, it could be three citizens. Um, but either way, I would not be involved, and in, neither would the village manager, since we likely already ruled on a situation, anyways. Mm -hmm. Did I miss anything, mm -hmm. Chris? No. Okay. So that's basically it. It's just changing the composition of the board, and it would match the tax board. Okay. And you, Chris, you didn't need to add anything? No, I, I don't. I mean, I, by okay. way of explanation, the, the reason why there's two different names for, for the Board of Tax Appeals is that there was, I want to use the year 2014. There were some state changes in, in income tax that we adopted. And so that in that legislation, there was an effective date of, I'll say, 2014 or 15. And, but you had to keep the old law on the books. And I think that's going to roll off the books next year, maybe. It, it's not really worth going into a lot of detail. Um, I think that only Jerry, Brian, and, and Karen might have been on the council when that occurred. Uh, actually, Marianne would have been too. But anyway, um, it's just in a name. It is not a substantive issue. Okay. Any questions from council? Yeah. So I have two pieces of paper here, mm -hmm. and they don't really apply to the new. The one with the blue, that one definitely does not. That was that was what I had written before I got a call uh, yeah. late in the afternoon on Thursday from uh, Chris's office saying, hey, we found this. Um, we want it to be the same. Are you okay with that? And I said, sure. And then that was already sent off to Judy, and I forgot to retract it. So Okay. And, and, and both boards are the same. They Same are, composition. Well, they are not currently. Um, we've I mean, never had to use the tax appeals board. There was a case that came up um, that we thought we were going to have to convene it. Um, so we had two options. We could either convene our board um, over $80, or we could um, not convene the board and just agree um, to the change that was to be made. Um, and it was going to be very complicated. It was with a, it was with a large organization with many different locations across the nation. And it was going to be very complicated over an $80, um, charge or dispute. So we did not have to convene that board, but it, it got us talking about the tax appeals board along with the utility dispute resolution board. So um, the the current citizens that sit on the utility dispute resolution board did agree um, that they would be involved in the tax appeals board. Do I ever really see that, you know, needing to to convene? Probably not. I mean, it hasn't been necessary so far. Would would it possibly need to convene for the lodging tax? Would the lodging tax fall under it, that? It would. Okay. That would. Well, so that's, that's that's what right. brought it back on our radar, right? Was that it was in that well, legislation. Uh, it, yeah, it did, but, but simultaneously to that, there was a, a ruling from the state tax court involving can, a Dollar General. They had made an, a uh, saying that the taxes had been properly collected, and the impact to the village was so negligible that it wasn't worth the expense to go through the administrative hearing process. So that had us look at the, we, we had to have a discussion about forming the board independently and then we also needed to have the discussion in the context of the interplay with the lodging tax. Yeah. So we've got it all. I think everything's copacetic now, mm -hmm. and we've got a, a, a structure that works. So I mean, I realize this is this is relating to to the board to both boards as a whole, not in particular individuals. But I do know that there are two people on the utility dispute resolution board. You said that those two people have agreed to serve on this one. So will that this two-year term apply for both of them, both of those boards? Um, the term wasn't something that I'd looked at with the tax appeals board. I mean, that would that would be the only other question I would think needs to be, you know, you, I would think that you would want them both to have yes. the same term. On the same cycles, yes. Yes, OK. I don't when, know that off the top of my head, but I'll, I'll confirm that. OK. Have, I mean, this council has not appointed them, have they? I don't remember. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, we did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Well, does it make sense for it to just be one board, or are we considering them to be two boards? They're two board because they have yeah, different, two different functions. functions. Yeah. Yeah. But, but we looked at that and determined it would be easier. We want to keep them as two boards. So yeah. this is just about the utility mm -hmm. board. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. And the mem but the membership on both boards would right. be the same. Right. Got mm -hmm. that. Yeah. yeah. And I'm assuming that the terms were changed to mirror each other because this initially said five-year terms and then one would serve a three-year term, and that was changed. So I'm assuming that that was... That because one of the, of the fact that, that the caught, tax dispute you know, board yeah. is a two-year term. So I would say that that was, that was already caught, and that's why that changed. Okay. So, and just to be clear, so that there will be, you will, the village manager will appoint one of the three people, but it won't be the village manager or the finance director. It will be another staff member. Correct. Okay. And I would assume well, that would be the same staff member will, for both. It may be a staff member, and it may be another citizen. citizen. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. But it's it's the appointment of the of the village manager. Correct. Okay. I, in the first, it, it says that council may not appoint an employee, a elected official, or contractor. Village manager may appoint, may not appoint the director of finance or equivalent officer or, or any direct support, subordinate thereof. I, that would mean that I could not appoint anyone who reports directly to Melissa. Nobody in finance, because they would have likely have been involved. <coughs> okay. That, that yeah. one no one in it. finance or the utility clerk or anything like that. So what keeps the village manager up appointing an, an employee that council would like to have? If council would like to make a suggestion, but see, but it, well, I'll see because it says council can't appoint them, and it may not appoint an employee, right? But if they tell you they like to have this person, then you appoint them. Then you know it, it, it's well. With all due respect to council. Yes, you you can make a suggestion, but see see to, see to me, you know, either either we can we can have a, a, an employee or not. Well, um, I, it, it I, just seems like a kind of a conflict to say council can't, but village manager can't. I think I think the reason that it says that, Jerry, is because technically, it would be for for you to appoint them. Um, they don't report to you. They don't direct report to you. Um, and I think that's where the conflict comes in for you to appoint an employee to the board. Um, it would be like you appointing an employee to another commission or board. I mean, I would assume that's where the problem would lie. Chris. I think it's a me it's a mechanism to try and maintain a level of independence. Right. Council has two two votes and a big place, and then the manager puts somebody else on. It's a mechanism. Okay. Any other questions? This is the first reading. We, this will come back to council, or we will have a second reading at the next meeting So, um, in a public hearing. But if any citizens have questions, um, I'll entertain those questions. Seeing and hearing none, I'll come back to council table. Judy, would you please call the roll? Yes. Sims? Yes. McQueen? Yes. Hempflin? Yes. Housh? Yes. Wintrow? Yes. Resolution 2017-51? Um, Go ahead and read this in in full. Okay, this is adjusting employee wage scales. Whereas Yellow Springs Village Council amended section 252.05 of the codified ordinances with the passage of ordinance 2010-26, which established a new methodology for the, for the adjustment of employee wages. And whereas the village manager has used this methodology and has recommended that the village employee wage scales be adjusted by 2.5% effective I think that should say on January 1st, 2018. It should. And whereas Village Council has concurred with this recommendation and asked that legislation be prepared to authorize this adjustment, now therefore Council for the Village of Yellow Springs, Ohio, hereby resolves that Section 1, Village Employee Wage Scales be adjusted by 2.5%. Section 2, this increase is to be effective January 1, 2018. Section 3, this increase will not be applied to the salary of the Village Manager, the Assistant Village Manager, Clerk of Council, the Chief of Police, Village Treasurer, or Law Director. Section 4, this resolution shall be in effect in full force upon its adoption. Thank you. Can I get a motion, please? So moved. Second. Um, 
I will say that, that uh, at the last meeting, um, Patty and I, who did the research? Did. Patty did the research um, by contacting surrounding communities and to see what other communities were doing as far as salary increases. And the average went from around 2% up to 2.5%. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it, um, I think last year our, our salary increase was slightly lower than that. Mm -hmm. So um, staff did make the recommendation to council at the last meeting that it be a 2.5%. Council advised um, staff to bring that resolution forward. And so here we are, council, and any input on it is money that has been budgeted, a salary increase has been budgeted by, by council and by the budget direct, finance director. And actually one, one entity was 2.75, so there was one, one that higher, was okay. slightly higher and one that was still in negotiations at three. So. Okay. Anyone, any other That's comments? Good. Comments or questions from citizens? Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor see, signify by saying aye. 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 And um, last one by title only. Yeah, this is resolution 2017-53, approving a designated agency endowment fund agreement with the Glen Helen Association and the Yellow Springs Community Foundation and authorizing the village manager to enter into the designated agency endowment fund agreement. Thank you. Can I get a motion, please? So move. Second. I'm very excited about this. This is something, I mean, this is a specific endowment and a specific fund with the Community Foundation, but I'm excited that we've started this. Patty, I'll turn it over to you for explanation. Um, as council remembers, uh, about a year, almost two years ago, we um, applied for a grant in conjunction with the Tecumseh Land Trust um, to remove the invasives from this piece of the Yellow Springs Creek that is on the property of the Bryan Center, the piece that runs right behind us here. And part of the agreement that we made um, when applying for that grant um, was that we would establish an endowment through which the uh, invasives could continue to be removed annually by the Glen to make sure that the, the property was maintained in its natural state. Um, this endowment will allow the Glen to do that on a, a continuing and perpetual basis. Uh, Nick Budis was hoping to be here, but he unfortunately had a meeting um, elsewhere that he could not be here at this time. But I do have an email from him if you would like to hear his, um, his thoughts on it. That's He's very idea. supportive of it. Um, he says, um, were I to be there, I would communicate to council that the proposed fund fulfills a promise initially set when the village, the Tecumseh Land Trust, and the Glen Helen developed a plan to restore the Yellow Springs Creek Riparian Corridor behind the Bryan Center. That plan brought two years of funding from the Clean Ohio Conservation Fund with the commitment that the village would fund ongoing land stewardship work at the scale of three to five days per year. The proposed fund with the Yellow Springs Community Foundation will allow that work to move forward on an ongoing basis. Um, Thank you. So that is the, it is the fulfillment of a commitment that we made nearly two years ago and it is our staff recommendation to council that we fund this and uh, create this endowment. A couple of questions. Um, I assume this is an open fund at the Community Foundation and citizens can contribute to this fund? It is and there is in the agreement uh, specific, it is specifically noted in the agreement that citizens would be able to um, contribute to that. And it's, if I recall, it was a somewhat generic name to the to the fund that could perhaps apply to other green spaces. Is that a possibility? Um, and to it, other conservation. That is correct. Um, I did ask them. It was a it was a relatively generic agreement to begin with. I did ask them to add a specific notation that um, it would include um, this particular corridor. Um, but was open to other, other uh, doing uh, other areas as well. Can, can you also talk a little bit about sort of how this fund works in terms of, I mean, just uh, fees and... Um, the Community Foundation does get a small administrative fee for uh, administering the investments that will um, keep this fund um, stable and uh, soluble. 
Um, the, when the Glen does the work, they will contact my office, the village manager's office, say we're going to do this work. Um, once they're done, I would verify that they have done it, and then a request for payment would be submitted to the community foundation to pay the Glen for the work. And do we know how much on an annual basis? It's around four to five hundred dollars a year right now. So depending on how that increases over time, um, but to fund it in perpetuity, I know that sounds like a very small amount compared to the the twenty thousand dollar endowment. But that's what it would take to create the um, generation of interest that would go towards this. So 20000 is enough for this to yes. be a true endowment? Yes. So when other funds get added, because when I read this, and I think you just said it, um, that people want to support other projects, mm -hmm. how is that going to work? It's going to get earmarked? or Well, we'll be able to contact the Community Foundation and, uh, and say, look, we have these other projects that we want to, for instance, we may create a stewardship of some type eventually on the Glass Farm wetland, mm -hmm. just as an example of, of another ongoing project that we have. Yeah. So we would go to them and say, we would like to do this. Is there enough money in the endowment to add this to, you know, with the donations to add this to the, the mix, or would it require another endowment from the village? How would that have to work? So. Okay. But I, I thought your question was, if, if I wanted to donate funds, can I earmark that they only go to a specific project, or you, the funds just go in? Right now, they would just go into the fund for the village green space maintenance that the community foundation is creating. And it is specifically an endowment fund? It is specifically an endowment fund. Um, and right now, the only project that is earmarked in it is the maintenance of this corridor. So let's say if there is, you know, going in along with, with what Jerry's saying, let's say there is something related to the wetlands or something that was more of a specific project. Mm -hmm. It would potentially not come out of that fund because That's that would not be part of an endowment. That would not be... It is not at this time, but it okay. could be added later. Okay. Okay. Because it's, then it's not very clear in the agreement to me because it does talk about donor's intent. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, should we be naming this fund something more specific if it's, if it's directed towards Yellow Springs Creek? Well, but I think I, maybe it's not necessarily just directed towards Yellow Springs Creek. Maybe it's about um, ongoing maintenance. I mean, maybe that's what it, maybe that's what it's about is about ongoing maintenance instead of discrete projects so it could need to be larger for example with the wetlands the on you know there may be a project at the wetlands that they want to do but the ongoing maintenance of the wetlands is a is an ongoing thing that will be less per year than a discrete project correct Well, Brian is thinking. Yeah. <laughs> I would just like to uh, acknowledge and let, and remind citizens that we now have two renaturalized areas that the village government and citizens own, and the one under discussion right now is right there to the north of the village building, the headwaters of the Yellow Springs Creek, and I encourage people to go and visit that area now that the honeysuckle and other invasives have been removed. And the other one that's been being mentioned at the glass farm is the same creek uh, it, that now includes the wetlands and a prairie that has paths in it, and we're still doing some follow-up work on that, but that's mm -hmm. almost completed. Mm -hmm. So they're both pretty cool places. I, I do think that there's something to be said for keeping this as for keeping an endowment fund and a project fund separate. Yes. And so maybe we should it should be clear that this is an endowment fund for ongoing maintenance as opposed to a fund that people if people wanted to see a big project happen mm -hmm. at Ellis Park, they mm -hmm. could put money into that a different fund. But yes. maybe there would be an endowment fund even for that mm -hmm. within this. So well, I guess, you know, since we're moving in this direction, it just makes me think, you know, um, Lori Asklin had mentioned this, you know, several years back. So I guess I would like to see that fund established, too, if we can 
you know, this for these other projects, you know, legacy gifts, whatever those might be. But I think well, it's probably complicated. I mean, I think it, it, it is relatively complicated because you have to have the money to start the fund and then, you know, because there's that administrative cost. And folks can always give to our green space fund here at the village and they can say it's earmarked for a specific project at that time and Melissa could create a budget line that says this is earmarked for this project. And obviously they get a tax receipt. We're a 501c3, mm -hmm. so all donations are tax deductible. I mean, Brian, I'm happy to talk to... It's almost to, the end of the year. <laughs> I'm happy to talk to Virgil and Gina Marie about it and, and uh, see yeah. what they can say. Um, I think it would be good just to, you know, since we're starting to open this, um, I think it makes sense. Okay. But um, I think this stands on its own. I mean, I think at this point this stands on its own and we should... As long as, long as it's clear that, you know, that people understand what this fund is for. Because in wording, at least in the agreement, it sounds like it's general mm -hmm. space. Um, I also had a recommendation, um, number three, gifts. Uh, and this goes to the second page. It says, uh, transfer to the foundation of property. And I know property can mean more than just land, but under number one, we do say um, property and money or property. I think number three means money or property too. So I think just so people are clear, uh, we should change that in the agreement before we sign it. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes, Chris. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yep. Okay. Any other questions from council? Oh. Comments or questions from citizens? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Okay. Um, now is the time in the agenda for uh, when we hear from citizens and I'm looking at the citizen I want to hear from first, Chief Altman, because I think I messed up. He was supposed to come up here during announcements. <laughs> or was I going to go to Chief? No, Chief, we were, we're going to talk at the very end of council. Actually, I think... <laughs> <laughs> um, so who is... I, I, I think both chiefs are coming up, right? Yes. Um, I think I was actually supposed to introduce it. I think that was yeah. probably well, this my is fault. good. So, okay. All right, Chief Altman, Chief Carlson. Aren't we looking official? Nice. We are, but I don't have a gun. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and there's a so reason. are you going to say? Um, uh, well, we have been meeting uh, the two chiefs and myself about New Year's Eve, and they are here to tell you um, what is going to happen on New Year's Eve. All right. Well, thank you very much. Well, I'm here because, uh, as you may remember, last year's New Year's Eve was a little bit out of the ordinary. Uh, we're trying to avoid that. Um, <laughs> some more than others. Um, we, uh, I had this brilliant idea early in the year that uh, we should sponsor, someone should sponsor the event and make it an official event. Not messing with the whole organic, sorry, that was your line, but okay. the organic uh, nature of the ball drop and the, the assembly, but at least making it official in that there's a street closure permit issued, the streets can actually be closed in a more kosher manner. Um, so we thought it'd be fun to uh, be the sponsor for MTFR. MTFR is rocking New Year's Eve. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we've been meeting, I've met with Brian and uh, with Patty, and we're talking about the different things. I mean, the biggest thing I think we want to just assure everybody is that we want it to be a fun, the same event it's always been, again, out last year is the outlier, um, just the fun event where everyone just gathers and has fun, and the disco ball drops and goes back up again and drops, and <laughs> everyone has fun, and then they wander home because it's cold. Um, so we're not planning anything major other than no. being there and smiling. I mean, for the first time this time, the fire department will be there in a more official capacity, i.e. giving out hot chocolate, sitting on a fire truck and smiling. Um, I could say something else, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I think that's it. We just want everyone to have a good time and kind of get back to how it used to be, a more more fun time. And, and Chief, yeah. are the are the 
Uh, officers excited? Very excited. We're going to have everybody out um, carrying garbage bags, the smile on their face, uh, be a family event, and we're excited about it. Thank you. Can we talk about safety too? Because I think that's a good, you guys have thought about that. Mm -hmm. Safety is our middle name. Absolutely. Yes. Well, we've got uh, the aid of our utilities as well with trucks. Um, we do need to barricade, you know, 68. Um, officer presence will be uh, in a normal capacity, but patrol cars will stay on the outskirts. We'll have pretty much full staff greeting, helping, doing anything we can uh, within that area uh, between 68 and Glen Street. Okay. All right. And we would encourage people to come and have a good time. Be careful oh, yeah. with breakable containers. Absolutely. Glass on the road is, is not fun or safe for anybody, so just be careful and be respectful of everyone. Have a good time. The Little Art will be having their party starting at 8 o'clock. Starting at 8 o'clock, so there will be activity already going on in front of uh, right in that space, so, mm -hmm. um, so they come out and join the party too. I, I know a citizen mentioned to me, I meant to mention this uh, earlier, but um, that given that it's a night that people are celebrating drinking alcohol that sort of thing that it maybe did not make sense to be advertising more widely outside the village because people driving in who may have been drinking so i i, I and it's not it's it's not advertised widely outside okay. the village Good. it's um it's not good yeah i just wanted to bring that up thank you thanks a lot any other questions yeah, I just I, I appreciate the collaboration, and um, it's great to see both of you guys uh, being the face on uh, the the village piece of keeping everybody fun and safe. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, It'll be a guys. Fun time. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> and thanks, Johnny. I appreciate it. We know there's going to be some of those I, I big just, trucks. You know, I just want to thank the guys for putting on. A nice event from my last day. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually what we're going on. Yeah. You got a big board with your face on it. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I see you there. Okay. So, any other any citizens' concerns? Um, we ask that you come up to the podium, keep your comments to three minutes, and state your name. <laughs> I believe you already covered some of my topic from the two gentlemen ahead of me. I'm Dale Amsetz. I live outside the village on West Tide Road. And I had an idea that kind of came along the same trend as what they did. But of course, nothing ever gets started unless there's an idea. So this is why I'm just kind of presenting it. Um, I even kind of gave it to the newspaper to see what, what might come of it. But it was partially concerned with the, with the New Year's idea here. And of course, this would also be depending on what happens with the school system and what they do. But, um, and here I even made a copy for you. Oh, thank you. Um, it was just a suggestion by me, somebody outside of the village, and I'm calling it the Mills Lawn Town Square. Route 68, like they just mentioned, is a state highway, and it is inconvenient to reroute the traffic through the residential areas. Due to the escalating conditions of the New Year's celebration, which was just brought up, um, and other events, I have a suggestion for a new idea. The founders of Old Savannah, Georgia, had a vision for multiple town squares. These town squares are still in existence today. Some have fountains, all have park benches, trees, and they are all beautiful and relaxing, if you've ever been to Old Savannah. I recommend that if, and this is always an if, if Mills Lawn would ever relocate because they talked about the school system possibly building in a different location, that I, my suggestion, if it was ever possible, that the village acquire the block of Mills Lawn, or acquire that block for Mills Lawn Town Square. With a town square, celebrations could be concentrated there, which is a very short walk from the main downtown. This provides close proximity to downtown shopping and restaurants during the rest of the year also, for in-store eating or for a short walk for lunch in the square. Benefits include concentration of activities adjacent to the downtown, relieve some traffic and pedestrian issues, provide bicycle-friendly destination to downtown shops and possible public restroom, and I was saying make the town square a show place for the community. That's 
all I have. Any questions? Thank you. No, it's thanks. like Hi. great. Thanks for thinking about us. Mm -hmm. Great suggestion. Um, anyone else? Yes. My name's Laurie Stover, and I've lived here. It'll be two years in the spring. And I was um, talking to some of the people who've been in the village a while, and they told me to come to the council and tell them what I'm doing in the village. To make a long story short, um, I was mentoring a 17-year-old woman that I brought to Yellow Springs with me. She um, was mentally ill, doing okay, terrible trauma. She got a job at one of the uh, merchants here in the village and was sold drugs from him and um, has been struggling with severe mental illness in and off of, in and out of um, acute mental health, um, uh, uh, acute units and just, it's a very, very sad story. So I've talked with a lot of people and I talked with the uh, police chief, I reported to the police chief, I also went to the safe house, went, talked to the safe house. Of course my mentoree didn't want to report because she felt like she would lose her friends and I spent a lot of time working, trying to talk with people in the village, um, went to the merchants, all of them were very open to looking at my flyer. I'm just trying to build a citizen's community watch, that's what my hat's about, because I feel very, very sad that I brought somebody to Yellow Springs and she left in horrific shape. She can't put two sentences together. And I, from all my conversation, it's been very clear to me that people are well aware of um, the drugs that are being sold at the Spirited Goat. And so I have um, put up flyers, they all get taken down. I put them up about every week and they're all taken down. So I just wanted to give you guys a copy of it and let you know that I'm trying to um, get people involved, but so far it's my one arm and me. Um, most people aren't very interested. So I'm just letting you know and wanted to thank uh, the chief because I did talk with you, but I think it's a very sad and um, troubling issue that I wanted to present and people suggested that I get it on council memo. So here I am. Any Thank questions? You. Thank you. No, I'm so, I, thanks for presenting it. Thanks for coming forward, Ms. Stober. And mm -hmm. sorry, so sorry that happened. And it's tragic. Um, I'm, I'm glad Chief is aware. That's really where it starts. And um, perhaps some mutual um, conversation among merchants and among, among towns people. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone else? Okay. So we're going to start with new business, um, and we'll start with uh, Mr. Burns, our electric superintendent. I think he wants some toys for Christmas. <laughs> well, I do. <laughs> so I can have more to do. <laughs> um, let me give you guys these copies. Here, just give them to me. I'll, we'll pass them down. I think we will. Yeah, I'll let you do it. We'll start with the valve exercising machine first. That's the only, that's the front page that I gave you. Uh, with the new plant coming online, the EPA is cracking down on the water distribution system. And we need to be able to get the equipment to be able to do the valve exercising, the unidirectional flushing program. Um, we've looked at several different machines. We've actually tested out uh, two of them, and this is the best bang for the cheapest dollar. Uh, this actually will uh, help us in the valve exercising. The actual part that turns the valve, it can either, the majority of them just go straight out from the machine. They're parallel to the ground. This one actually will raise up or go over guardrails or uh, behind bushes and stuff like that. Um, it does have a uh, suck vac on it where we can use it to suck out valve boxes, try to find curb boxes and all that. Um, with this machine, uh, when I was talking to them, I talked to them for about two hours on the phone before they come to uh, the village of Yall Springs. They're actually from South Dakota. Uh, they actually have a unidirectional program that they will take our system that we had done with um, a higher real water. They will actually enter it into the computer system to where we can just follow the computer and it will GPS everything as we go to that machine. It will actually tell you what valve it is. 
and, and mark the location. So we start a history with every valve. We actually start a history with every hydrant. <clears throat> when this computer goes on and it fills a rough spot in the valve, it will actually mark that, back it back, and it'll sit there and work that rough spot out. And it will actually notate that in the computer system that valve maintenance is done. Uh, you can actually make notes in the system. If you, if you find something wrong yourself, you can actually make a note in there. So is this all happening? I mean, is that, is that all part of that? That's all part of that whole system. And, and so um, with that same system, <clears throat> majority of the other machines that we tested out, once you take that computer away from that machine, the machine is useless. You can't run it, you can't operate it. With this one, you can do it manually. So if your computer is down, or you don't want to take the computer out for that one day, you got one valve to go turn, you can actually do it manual. <clears throat> you can actually set the torque on the machine to where it won't put too much torque on the valve to break it. So this one is the one that we are recommending uh, to purchase. We are actually recommending that it goes on with the water plant so when we have the big ground breaking. We can have it there. Let the EPA let the EPA know that we're serious about getting back on board and getting the distribution up to par, along with the new water plant. Does this does the vac part of it replace that other vac that we got, or is it probably not as it, powerful? It does not replace the big truck vac, but what it does replace is the one that needs repaired for the water side okay so we'll be able to list it on gov deals on okay. or scrap it that's how bad it is and when johnny says <clears throat> it go on with the water plant um what he means is that um even with the guaranteed maximum price that shook gave us um we are saving enough money on the plant that we could purchase this piece of equipment and still end up being below mm -hmm. the $7.2 million. That was our guaranteed maximum price. And having a deduct at the end of the contract. Correct, Johnny? That, that's absolutely correct. I talked to Shook as of uh, Friday and verified that. The only thing that I eliminated on this at this time is a hot water heater. And I was like, why do you need a hot water heater? But then they come from South Dakota, and he says, you ever have any valves that are full of ice? And I'm like, yeah. Yeah, but everything that on that hot water heater, we can add that later, and you'll have to add it right now. Is this the one, Johnny, <clears throat> that we said could be used minimally to shoot um, like a directional bore of some kind, or it, is that one of the other it ones? Ha no, it has a... Uh, actually an eight foot rod that we can go underneath sidewalks and, and use the water pressure to get underneath sidewalks oh, nice. and suck it out as you do it. Nice. It, it is not cheap. It is $63,379. Who, who maintains it? I mean, is that, I mean, I guess it really uh, as doesn't of, matter. For the maintaining, uh, for the first year, it's actually the people from South Dakota. After that, uh, Ferguson Water out of uh, Columbus and out of Dayton would be the so there is contact. somebody relatively there is. locally correct and and leasing does leasing a, p a piece of equipment like this make any sense not for as much as we're going to use it and what did you say the cost was going to be it's um <clears throat> sixty three thousand three hundred seventy nine dollars and three cents and that includes the GIS that includes application? Everything. That includes so the, the software computer, all of them setting it up the other thing it does um and I know the chief, I talked to Chief Altman about this, is there'll be a system to where we can uh, deploy different modulars on fire hydrants. While we're testing one, it will take a reading from the other one. So it's also going to be able to let us know what our fire flow, what our static pressure and all that is on every hydrant as we do the, fire, uh, the unidirectional flushing. That way if somebody says, hey, what's the fire pressure on that uh, fire hydrant over there on West College, we can look it up on a computer and tell them exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. Nice. Okay. Johnny, um, yes, can you speak a little bit about the valves, their function, how, how frequently <clears throat> they are spaced, and what, if any, relationship they have to the fire hydrants? Uh, Actually, in front of the hydrant, there's actually a valve that actually just shuts off that one hydrant if they're not buried. Uh, we have found probably 10 since we've been here that are buried, but we uncover them. 
Uh, valves are supposed to be spaced every 500 feet, depending on the engineer. Uh, we're finding out there are a lot further, <coughs> except for the new projects that have been done. Uh, all the ones on the new loop and all that is every 500 feet, you'll have a valve to be able to isolate the system. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the valves not being turned for the amount of period of time that they are, working them very slowly is the key. Um, and making sure you don't apply too much torque to them. Uh -huh. That's the reason why there's a torque setting on the machine. Even though the guys won't be handling it, the machine, you can set it from uh, one pound of torque to 800 foot pound of torque. They don't recommend you do more than 250 on a valve at any time, just sit there and keep working it. Uh, when we did the one for the water plant, it took me and two other guys eight hours to get a full shutdown on the 16 inch valve. And that was holding the machine, and then we take turns. And, and the other thing is we had to count every rotation because the rotation counter is broke. So you imagine 64 turns sitting there watching that shaft go around. We had to get really creative. And, and is there potential injury or danger On, on that staff? particular machine there is because you're actually holding that machine and one guy's got the throttle. So if you have the button and he gets wedged, it's just going to sit there and keep turning. And I just want to remind council that it, Johnny mentioned the EPA and, and making sure they know we're doing this, that, that our water system isn't just the water plant, that with the new water plant that we're going to have, it also is the distribution system. This relates to the distribution system, which we have equal challenges with, and this will certainly help. Correct. Um, and it's really a necessary component to effectively getting the new water, new water treatment plant operating and, and getting that water moving more cleanly, more quickly into our houses and businesses. That's correct. So Johnny, is this something that, so we use it for a while, we get our system cleaned up and then we don't need to continue using it? Like we could sell it no. later? Or? No, this machine would never be sold, it would be well maintained. Uh, and this machine should be used at least once a week going from the time we get the system up and running uh, forever. I mean, th the machine is going to be purchased knowing that the staff is going to use it. I mean, we have to start exercising these valves. We have to start rotating hydrants. This will also allow, uh, it's got a fire hydrant adapter, so when you're flushing hydrants, you've heard the water hammer effect this machine you actually put it on there you turn it and it will actually open and shut that hydrant to where you don't get a water hammer effect the human error is one spin every second where you get tired and you start cranking it faster you get a water hammer effect and then you a start water breaking what? a water hammer effect so oh. if, you, if you've ever had a tube and you you can hear it clunk on one end as soon as you well, you do that with water and you'll break the water mains oh. so if you got to shut them get open them down slow or open them up slow and close them down even slower so hopefully this will help i see a lot of head nodding coming from our fire chief <laughs> who's very familiar with our hydrants <laughs> so. very good idea. Okay. any other comments or questions yeah i do want to just uh, this makes me think johnny and patty that um, you know, we've talked in the past about shared services and, you know, if equipment, you know, could be, I don't know, rented, shared, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not saying that this is that piece, but I just wanted, since it's on my mind, to mention when we have those opportunities, I'd like to explore them. Correct. Yeah, and normally I, I regularly meet with the other managers in the area. We have lunch and we talk about that very thing. And if we need to borrow a piece right. of equipment or something, we I, generally do that. We did that okay. for the project at DYS, didn't yeah. we? The, didn't we borrow a piece of equipment from someplace for the water line, the water and sewer line extension from Enon to? Oh, uh, we did from Fairborn, yes. Yeah. Uh, we actually uh, borrowed a, a crawler. Actually, they come and helped us do it, mm -hmm. where they lowered a uh, camera system in there on a track and they went and found a manhole that was buried. So why don't you talk about your other Okay, things. the other one is the bucket truck. <clears throat> Let me get that file here. With having the bucket trucks uh, tested yearly, uh, we are not having good luck with the oldest one, which is a 2005. Uh, it's actually uh, 
broke at the moment, it's out of service, and I have a loaner truck right now to be able to have the second truck available. Uh, the truck in 2016, I just, I pulled invoices for the last two years on it. Um, we spent about $13,000 keeping this truck in running condition to be able to operate. Uh, the latest one was six, um, I'm sorry, $865 for a part on the motor just to get it to start up to be able to get it tested for the dielectric testing and then it failed the dielectric testing. So I was like, well, crap, why did I spend $865? But um, the new one on the pictures, if you see side by side, uh, the new one is 15 feet taller. Mm. That makes a huge difference. Right now, uh, when we're work, working the three phase and changing the transformers out, uh, we can only use the big truck, which eliminates one guy should be up here helping the other guy, but the other guy is five, ten feet shorter than the transformer. So um, we've had a couple instances where we've had to actually cut our way into it, back the truck all the way up against the pole, and then sting up, and you're still about five feet short. So if you notice the truck on the uh, left, as you're looking at it, it's a shorter one, the big difference between the two is, is on the 2018, the top boom has a boom inside it. So then once you get up to the maximum height, you can sting out another 15 feet. The one on the left, it goes 37 feet. The one on the right actually goes 52 feet, five inches. Um, and majority of the poles are 40 foot plus. So our other truck, the big truck actually goes 65 feet. Um, and we use it night and day. We'd like to be able to have the second one to be able to help it assist in uh, fixing the cross arms and the primary and stuff like that. Um, so I did some research on, on the new truck. They actually brought it in, let us check it out, demo it, um, and then they gave us the quote. And um, with the quote, that truck right there is... After trading, it's 134,281. It was actually 138,000 until four o'clock, and I called them back and I said they're only wanting to give us ten thousand dollars for the old truck. And I'm like, I was expecting thirty thousand. So the email is what um, they gave me the reasoning why they could not do no more than fourteen thousand dollars trade in is because. They're expecting in two years I'll have to put uh, another uh, $15,000 into the motor because it's a bad motor that Ford produced at that time. So right now with that out of service, I'm looking at just to get it back on the road almost $7,000. And how and much it, are you paying weekly for rent? I, right now they're giving to me because we're looking at buying another one. So, oh, so you're borrowing it from these? <laughs> right. You're borrowing the I'm truck I'm borrowing a truck from <laughs> that we would like to buy, but they, they brought it as a demo. So <coughs> okay. right now, and they could come and get it tomorrow. I, I don't know that. So before I spend another $7,000 into a truck um, that we've already spent thousands of dollars into and it really does not serve our purpose, I wanted to come to council and see what you guys thought about putting the money more in a positive way versus spending it and basically throwing the money out the window. And what's the life of this truck? I'm, I'm hope the new truck, I would think 15 years. Pretty good value. With it being well maintained, we could probably stretch it even further than that. And all of these vehicles are going to be able to be undercover in the... They are undercover. Uh, they are all in, inside the barns. And, and the, the other one, the what, the valve yes, machine? Yes, it okay. will be back in the new That will uh, make a huge difference. Um, one thing I will say is the exhaust system on the new one is the green style to where you actually put fuel in there and it helps reburn the exhaust uh, before it goes in. The difference between the two trucks is you can actually stand here and talk next to the new one and you wouldn't even know it was running. The old one, you can't because, number one, the fumes are going to get you. Number two is it's so loud. So I can actually say it's probably the worst smelling truck I've had in my career. So it sounds like you're interested in getting an, this new truck sooner than later. Absolutely. What kind of um, 
payment plan would we be looking at? That would well, be um, Johnny and I talked about it because um, <coughs> he had bought a line truck, which was um, comparable price. And when we were looking at that um, and what the interest costs, um, I think it would be better to just pay for it outright um, versus um, financing it because the electric fund has enough in the capital equipment budget to be able to support it um, and that would save us about, I think I calculated $14,000 in interest. So that was my recommendation. I would think so. Sounds good. How much would we still have in the capital fund? Um, I mean, we'd have a, I, I think probably about two hundred thousand dollars left. The electric I mean, we'd, fund is we'd in still, good shape. Yeah. Right. yeah. Okay. So, council's inclined. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Santa came early this year. <laughs> this is what I like. Do, do we vote on this? Um, it'll just. Yes. I, 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 I would appreciate it if oh. someone would make a motion. Can I, I, a motion? I move okay. that uh, we approve the purchase of the. New truck as per Johnny's uh, description, and and you wanted the, the valve machine also. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. That was a change. Oh, order. okay. So, change order. Okay, but that. Okay, and the valve machine, paid for, separate. Yes. Out of diff two different funds. Mm-hmm. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Johnny. Mr. Budis, we've already had our discussion regarding your legisla the legislation. He's, he's here for... Oh, you're here for something else, too? Okay, then. Good. We, it went very well, though. We're going to have an endowment fund. I'm happy to answer questions if anyone has. Before we, does anybody have any questions about the endowment? Are we... Okay. No. Um, okay, I just lost track of myself. Um, I don't know which got on here first. The, I think the 2018 council retreat, Marianne. Okay, yeah. Um, we're going to have two new council members, and um, generally we schedule a retreat. Well, I'm not actually sure. But later in the first quarter, I believe that because we have two new council meetings, two new council members, and, and the composition is going to change pretty much because Karen and Jerry two stalwart council members are leaving, that it would be good to have our 2018 retreat as soon as possible so, so that the full new council has a chance to get together for a longer period of time and talk about council goals and the kind of things that we do at a retreat. So uh, I wasn't sure whether that needed to come to council, but I, what I'd like to do is direct Judy to uh, uh, contact the two new council members that are coming on as well as Brian, Judith and myself to find out dates that as soon as possible in January actually I'd like to have our retreat. Yeah, I strongly I, support that. Yeah, yes. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, yeah, if we could have it between the first and second meeting, uh, if we could find a date, so between January 2nd and um, 16th. Who's setting the agenda? <laughs> yeah, that, that. I mean, I. Um, <laughs> I know Brian. You had talked about maybe a couple half days, and I don't know what makes sense, but um, it seems like we want our new council members to have to be able to weigh in on the agenda. Also, so. So that seems like that would be a discussion item for the first meeting yeah. in January. Mm -hmm. So if you find a date, it seems like if you find, find a, date, a date that everybody can meet, then at the first meeting in January, you decide what the agenda mm -hmm. is. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's good. Great. Okay. Now I think the item that Nick is here to talk about, the Yellow Springs Clifton uh, Road um, bike connector. Uh, yes. So let me uh, say a few words about that, and then uh, since Nick and Marsha are here, I'd like you guys to kind of take it away. Um, so some folks may know that for over 30 years uh, there have been there has been discussion about a uh, a trail from Yellow Springs out to Clifton, uh, particularly providing non-motorized access to John Bryan uh, State Park to the Clifton Gorge, um, and certainly, you know, it'd be nice to, you know, go out to Clifton Mill and things like that, too. Um, 
And uh, I think, except for the exceptional, uh, most people biking are not comfortable taking State Route 343 <coughs> out there. Uh, I'm an avid biker, I'm not comfortable at all. Very little room. It's already a substandard road, we found out. It's like uh, nine feet, roads should be 11 feet. Per lane. Uh, per lane, yes. Um, so uh, the discussions have come up, they've stalled, uh, but finally there seems to be a lot of traction. Um, uh, this has partly been led by uh, Mayor Beery uh, out in Clifton and, and some of those folks. But what's been uh, exciting is that the Ohio Department of Natural Resources is coming to the table. They think this is a great idea. Um, Ohio Department of Transportation has come to the table. They think this is a great idea. And in the past, they had been part of those roadblocks. Um, and we've also had uh, the Glen Helen, which Nick can speak to himself, uh, join some meetings to talk as well about the benefits that this could have for access to the Glen on the Raptor Center side. Um, the letter that's in the packet, I think, articulates a lot of the benefits for our villagers in terms of having a safe, uh, health-promoting, environmentally sound way to get out there without having to get into a car. Um, and certainly, if we're thinking about families, uh, seniors, uh, those with disabilities, this would be a way to get access that they, not, they don't have right now. Um, so I think that's enough uh, for me. I, I will note that um, we do have a resolution from the village of Clifton that they passed a couple months ago. And um, maybe with that, uh, Nick, if you want to speak about the Glen's interest first, and then Marsha will talk from uh, the other, another perspective. Um, good evening. Um, uh, I'm enthusiastic about the option to, to move this idea forward, uh, and, and I say this partially as the director of Glen Helen, and partially as one of the, the cyclists who've done the route down 343, and, and you feel your, your shoulders tense up every time you, you hear the sound of a vehicle coming uh, behind you, hoping that this one is going to give you an adequately wide berth. Um, um, Glen Helen uh, manages between uh, college-owned properties and, and Glen Helen Association-owned properties about a third of the distance between uh, the village of Yellow Springs uh, and Clifton uh, and, and come to the table with a real interest in, in, in trying to help uh, uh, see that this, this moves forward through, through work on my part and work on, on part of our staff and, and volunteers. Um, one, of, one of our interests is in trying to make it easier for cyclists and folks with limited mobility to access some of the, the key parts of the Glen, the Yellow Spring, the Cascades, Raptor Center, Outdoor Education Center, uh, and see uh, the possibility of a bike path down 343 as, as, a, as a way towards, towards accomplishing that. Uh, when we acquired property from uh, uh, the uh, Case family, uh, uh, two years ago, uh, one of the things that, that we were uh, made aware of at the time, that was a property uh, that was placed under easement through the Tecumseh Land Trust, uh, and they had specifically included language in it uh, uh, anticipating the possibility of a bike path to say, even though this has a conservation easement on it, we want to make clear that, that this would not preclude any, uh, any efforts to, to build a, a bike path along, along the way. Uh, and that's... Uh, you know, that's, I think, the kind of, of uh, 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 hand of outreach that we bring to the table in terms of trying to see uh, what we can do on our side to, uh, to help uh, see that something works out. Thank you. I have, I have a couple of questions. Um, I'm a cyclist, and I have cycled on 343 as well as into the Glen. Mm -hmm and then to the Raptor Center. Mm -hmm. And neither the path going into the Glen from 343 nor to the Raptor Center is particularly accessible. So do you have plans for increasing the accessibility of those paths or how would you, how would the bike path 
than interface sure. with whatever the plan is. Um, uh, fair question, and I don't want to distract from the uh, uh, the core matter of, of uh, investigating the possibility of the, the connector between uh, Yellow Springs and Clifton. But when we uh, when we developed a conservation easement on the Glen, uh, we uh, allowed for the possibility of, of uh, a parking area off of 343 that would provide level access uh, to folks who were who were coming to the Yellow Springs, recognizing that the previous parking lot uh, that was off of 343 was kind of too close to the ecological heart of the Glen uh, and also too far off the path to be adequately patrolled by, uh, you know, then the the, the county sheriff. Um, so. Uh, one of the things that we we would uh, want to pursue is how do we create an opportunity for people to access the park to visit in, in that that level area off of 343. Uh, we would never intend to pave the road to the Raptor Center. We want it to be a rustic experience, but we also want it to be level and accessible and smooth. Uh, and that'll be that'll be work on us. Sounds great. Um, thank you. Okay, one other question. Um, in the letter from the Glen and the Transportation and Bike Yellow Springs, which I guess is Marsha, um, there's a request that the village uh, pledge $10,000 toward the study, the feasibility study. Is the Glen able to put in at least a token amount toward uh, that? The, the, the Glen's able to put in more than a token amount, which amounts to my time and effort. As in, what what will that? Oh uh, well, just the in-kind support of, of having a, a person able to uh, to uh, to work towards uh, this. You mean you would be working uh, working towards what? Um, uh, making this happen. Towards towards participating the, the in connector? meetings and what's that? Ma making the connector happen. Yes. Yeah. And you did say that. You, you think you guys have about a third of the property that uh, would that's need to be? The, at, at my, my assessment is, you know, looking at essentially the, the kind of three miles between um, our, uh, our property extends. Uh, there's there's um, uh, kind of one, one farm between us and Meredith Road, so we, we get you almost all the way to Meredith Road. Hmm. Okay, great. Thanks, Dick. All right. Thanks, Marcia? Man. Good evening. Um, I'm Marcia Sauer, and I'm here to, well, wearing several caps. Uh, current member on the um, Active Transportation Committee, recently um, appointed president of our newly formed, and maybe many um, in uh, council chamber this evening, and maybe even all of you at uh, council table aren't aware of that Bike Memory Valley now has um, a new chapter, the Yellow Springs chapter of Bike Memory Valley, um, and I'm going to be the president of our new chapter. I wear the cap of principal owner, past principal owner and current co-owner of the Village Cyclery for the past 31 years and decades of uh, bicycle advocacy, both locally, regionally, and um, on a state level. But here this evening to just um, uh, express my appreciation for you considering this resolution and joining in on this project. Um, just to cast a little more on the background, um, Nick and Brian both um, already um, touched on this. But this idea of this corridor, of this link between Yellow Springs and Clifton goes back decades was part of the original conversation in the late 80s when people like Milt Lord and Ed Dressler and Jim Schneider and all of the folks um, uh, were putting together those those conversations and thoughts about the Little Miami Scenic Trail. It was This was always a piece of it. This was always a consideration, kind of a phase two of it. Um, from a community um, and um, longtime villager Al Denman, he, I'm telling you, if we could get this project through while Al is still with us, mm -hmm. he would be one happy man. Al mm -hmm. Denman fought hard and believed in this and championed this and wanted this for a very long time, as did um, David Case. I imagine that, um, as Nick was talking about the easement on the Case 
um, property. That probably has a lot to do with date with where David Case's um, heart was on this project as well. Um, looking a little further um, forward um, back, I believe it was, gosh, I'm trying to remember now. Um, in the late 90s, um, Planning Commission asked me to start what was then the first bicycle committee, the Bicycle Enhancement Committee following um, following the train station and following um, the skate park that I had worked on. Um, and we put forth various projects and various bodies of work, but one of the last projects that we did, um, at least in my um, tenure with um, the Bicycle Enhancement Committee was something called, and some of you on uh, council, this might resonate with you, something called the Northern Gateway Project. And part of the Northern Gateway Project included this, this project. As it did, kind of the enhancement and the maintenance of right back here, the Yellow Springs um, Creek area. So I'm really excited to, to, um, to see that. So this is all by way of saying this idea, this notion has really stood right um, up, to the, up to time and up to decades and here we are now um, and I feel like it's time has come. You know, there's obviously great synergy, great cooperation, it's wonderful to see the village of Clifton, um, the partnership with the Glen, um, the partnership with, and Brian spoke to that, it wasn't so much ODNR over the years that kind of threw up the roadblocks as it was ODOT threw up the roadblocks and for all the obvious reasons, you know, primarily the intersection, um, you know, right there at Cemetery Street and um, um, 68 and, and 343. But again, just to mirror everything that has already been said, um, as has, has been the spirit and the mission of our amazing network of trails is to provide those protective corridors um, for, you know, for everyone, for everyone of every capability, right, of every level of mobility, of every, of every age. Um, they should be afforded that. And this is really kind of the missing link. This really does connect what we have begun, what has been, has become a wonderful legacy, not only for Yellow Springs, but for this entire region and this entire state and um, connects our crown jewels, you know, the Glen, you know, John Bryant, you know, Clifton Gorge. Um, and just from the perspective of my years at the bike shop, I can't tell you how many times people say, hey, how do I get, how do I get? How do I get out to Clifton Gorge? How do I get out to John Bryan on my bike? And I'm like, well, 343 is how you get the job done. And it isn't. For all of you who, you know, we've already heard those testimonies. It's not the safest route to be on. It's narrow. There's no shoulder. There's no berm. When a car comes, you know, that's as a as a seasoned cyclist, you know, and one who's, you know, pretty adventuresome, um, you know, I'm I'm loath to claim my lane on 343 because there's <laughs> Judy's rolling rise. There's really nowhere to go when you claim your lane. So you really, you know, you get pinched on the side there, you know, and there's no, when two cars are coming, you know, in opposite directions and there's no, there's no berm there. So I want to thank you for considering this. Um, uh, it, I just wholeheartedly support this and I just think it would be great. Um, great for the village, great for the community, and um, just great for this area. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. Thanks, Marcia. Oh, thanks, Marcia. So Brian, what are you proposing? Um, well, I mean, to me, it's a very compelling argument. Um, I think we should, as council, uh, consider a resolution. And um, I think it's very notable that the village of Clifton has, uh, it has contributed some money to a feasibility study. Uh, $3,000 for the village of Clifton, I was told by the mayor, is a very significant part of their budget. I, think so. um, I guess the other thing that you know, I think a little bit about is um, we have talked about community action planning, um, and I, one piece of that is active transportation, non-motorized. So I think it hits a lot of village values. Um, so I like the idea of a resolution and I think we should help make this project come to fruition with helping with the feasibility study. I would like to suggest that we bring this resolution to the next meeting and get it done. I'd like to get this done on my watch. Can I ask a question first? Okay. There have been studies already done, I imagine. Um, 
here to Clifton. Right? Not that well, I know. Well, but, but what I'm hearing is, is that the state no doubt have been opposing this, and the main concern has been 343-68 Cemetery Street. And so it seems like to me studies have been done. So another feasibility study is going to answer the same question as Actually, yes, I, we, well, let me finish. Oh, I'm sorry. That, that yes, we like to have it and, and we need it. So I just have a problem about spending money to get a yes, yes ans answer when we all know the answer is yes. And we got two communities. I, I'd rather see money going to trying to lobby someone to now let's let's get get the action movie versus another study saying we need that route. We got three important areas that you can't get to really by walking and by biking. And to me, it seems like the hangle is. We already know the road is too small right now to standards. So the hangup is getting the funds, or someone appropriating the funds to make that happen. And, and, and I don't, you know, I just don't see where another yeah. feasibility study is going to get anybody off the dock. Well, maybe I can, I've been at the meeting. So the feasibility study we're talking about here is to figure out the cost. So this is not about, and the, and the route. So this is not about, ODOT's already said we can do it. ODNR's already said we can do it. So this would be, um, someone referred to it as a micro-engineering study. So take a little section, figure out how much it would cost to engineer that, and then you would extrapolate uh, how much it would cost from there. Okay, I There's a lot of pieces that have to be put together. Yeah. But I mean, if if this had been put in the packet, that would have saved my question. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a good to, question. To, to, to waste time and yeah. saying the feasibility study, but it really is a it is a cost. Say this is what we think it's going to cost. Yeah. Not not a fee. See, because I see a feasibility study as being you know, what we need to do with it. Yeah. So almost like a needs a needs yeah. assessment. And, and Let me just quickly. Um, but, but no, I mean I I understand. Yeah. Yeah. What yeah. we're really going after is this is how much it's going to cost state, yeah. federal, who, whoever, to get this job done now. Let's see what we need to money. Right. And just quickly, let me just um, answer something, Jerry, that you, you sort of brought up um, a moment ago. Um, back when, at times, you know, this discussion would, would occur, and it would occur during some particular funding cycles that, you know, we'd kind of reintroduce it, um, it always, the roadblock it always hit with ODOT um, was precisely that in that intersection, and it had everything to do with recognizing that the right of the right of way for the bike trail um, would be on Glen property, you know, would be on the case property, would be, you know, as, as Nick just spoke to, we can get you to Meredith Road and, and beyond. And at that point, at those various times in the past, that became a stopping point because we just didn't have that level of support and we just didn't, you know, couldn't get, get past that. But we're we're not there now. We're, right. That's what I said earlier. I just feel like all the pieces that have kind of prevented this from from really coalescing are are really right. um, really. Yeah, important. I mean, ODNR is interested because they're interested in having more people in supporting their parks. Um, Green County Parks is obviously interested for the same region reason and the Regional Planning Commission and the whole issue of, of supporting and expanding the trail system um, and transportation options are the issue now. Can I ask where exactly is the bike path? It, it would be next to the road? We don't know. I mean, that's part of figuring I mean, is that's what, out. Is but that yeah. the likely place? Yeah, we think the... It's it not going like to be next to the Glen, right next to the Glen proper. No, so this would be mm -hmm. uh, off-road trail off-road path right. and um, ODOT believes that we can run it the length of 343. And where is the likely money to come for actually building the bike? Um, you have the Clean Ohio Fund um, that you can get 
up to 500,000 for. Um, there's the rec, tra the rec trails program. Um, there's also uh, TA transportation alternatives money, which is allocated through MDR. So it's likely not to come out of our funds. So where oh. we come up with? I I, I, mean, I would I, not advocate us paying I for would, construction. Given the time, and we've got a lot on our agenda yet, I would like to make a motion that we bring this to council for the next meeting as a piece of legislation. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Um. Okay, where did my agenda go? Do they have an agenda? Yeah, alternative. Alternative BC and um, BC okay, uh, Mary Ann, um, that, yeah, Environmental Commission letter. Yeah, um, one of the uh, projects that the Environmental Commission is working on, which started with uh, uh, alternatives to pesticides, is also including how uh, property owners can naturalize their property. And Nadia Malarkey is spearheading that work. She, she's also working with mothers uh, up front who... Out front. Out front? Yeah. Out front. Who have a similar interest in lowering our carbon footprint by having people naturalize their yards and not use gas-powered lawnmowers. So Nadia, is in connection with the mothers out front is going to be making a presentation on pollinator regeneration and the the presentation and workshop are going to be next year in February March sometime the environmental commission wants to write a letter supporting this project and our the commission's understanding was that if a commission wants to support something they need to come to council for approval to do that but there's no funding, we're not putting any money toward it, just saying that the Environmental Commission supports it. So I'm coming to council asking for approval to uh, support the Environmental Commission writing a letter with giving it support Do you make a motion? project. Are you making a motion? Okay. I make a motion uh, that uh, council approve the Environmental Commission supporting uh, the project that Nadia Malarkey and the Mothers Out Front will be doing on pollinator regeneration plan, planning. Second. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, um, Planning Commission alternate. Judith, or no, Jerry, excuse me. Jerry, you got the letter there. Okay. <clears throat> uh, I'd like to nom nominate Andrew Williams as the uh, alternate for the uh, Planning Commission. Uh, Mr. Williams uh, has a uh, bachelor's degree in political science and a master's in public administration uh, from the University of Dayton. Uh, his experiences include internship with the City of Dayton Department of Planning and Citizen Participation. Uh, as well as the current position of Chief Def Deputy of uh, Green County uh, Recorder's Office. Uh, and I think Mr. Williams would make. Mr. Williams also lives at uh, 521 uh, Dayton Street, and I think he'd make a fine addition to uh, the planning, and, uh, and uh, he would be a good option. Is that your motion? Second. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, I think we're done with the uh, new business items, so we'll move back to old business, outreach specialist funding job description. Uh, who's going to start that discussion, Patty? Chief. There. Chief. <laughs> Council would take one of those, please, and pass them down. I think we got it already. Oh, do you? Okay. Yep. Thank you. First off, uh, I apologize for these not being in the packets. So, in response to the request from Justice System Task Force to create a comprehensive outreach program to our at-risk populations, um, in conjunction and unity with, with Kate, Justice System Task Force, we've created the attached job description for outreach specialist. It is difficult for officers to maintain pace with the community demand for continual outreach services. 
The more time we're able to spend helping our at-risk populations, including engaging and connecting them with area social services, the more positive the impact will be on our community as a whole. This position would be the primary conduit for consistent contact with those at-risk populations to better ensure that they have the resources they need to be successful. The outreach specialist would preferably have some understanding of law enforcement culture as this will aid in navigating the environment in order to best help the individuals served. However, the main focus will be in community outreach. We should consider this as a pilot program because we'll, we will be learning as we go, but the immediate benefit <clears throat> will be more community contact and officer assistance through a single source of direction coinciding with the guidelines for village policing guidelines that council has approved and I've been tasked to facilitate. While we have considered this position to have some type of collaboration with the mayor's office, I have concerns about potential conflicts of interest due to the sensitive nature of our cases and the law. Due to the recent departure of Officer England, the police department has three vacant full-time positions. Considering the concerns of the police department budget, and though I believe ideally those positions should be filled with sworn officers, I feel strongly enough in the need for this position that I respectfully request to fill one of those positions with the outreach specialist and ask you to approve that position. This will be of great benefit to the community and the department. I am excited about this potential for this within our department and the community and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, I don't have any questions <laughs> of you right now. Um, I, I feel like, I mean, I was really looking forward to the Skype conversation with the police social worker, and I understand we can't do that tonight uh, for uh, technological reasons. Um, but I do feel like I would like to, for me, I, I feel like I need to hear, talk to that person. I want to hear from that person um, in order to be able to think about this. Uh, I mean, the recommendation JSTF was a police social worker, so it's a slightly different concept. Um, I really appreciate, Chief, you uh, working on this and what you put before us. As I, as I told you when we talked about it, um, once something's con a concrete proposal is in front of us and uh, we have something to look at, it helps us to be able to think about it. Um, and I don't want you to be offended. <coughs> we may tinker with this concept. Um, I mean, depending on what the whole council thinks, of course. But um, I personally would like to talk to a police social worker. Um, you know, the, the original concept to just be able to think more fully about what makes sense for our community. I think this is a really important position. Uh, I'm so glad our chief is so uh, excited about adding this kind of position. I think in terms of the kind of changes we want to see in our police department and the kind of needs that they are constantly running up against, uh, this will be a, a great addition. So, um, but, but I feel like, and before I can really think about it fully, I, I want to talk to, uh, to someone who, um, is one of those or that sort of original concept and to be able to hear 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 from them so that's my own feeling thank you um, I, I uh, really appreciate all the work that you've done that Kate's done thank you and anyone else that's been involved in in thinking this through I also appreciate that you have figured out a way to keep it within the budget that's a real plus um, I support it I do see this as probably a sort of pilot project, whether we call it a pilot project or not. We've never done it before, and I imagine that as this person comes on, their duties will evolve as that person, the department and the village government sort of learns how to do this. So uh, I think that's my main comment that uh, uh, I also appreciate that it's a 30 hour rather than like a 20 hour. I mean, it seems like it's going to. Involved, and hopefully then it will allow officers to be taking this little bit of a step back from doing some of this kind of work and that that person will actually be freeing them up, officers up. So you have my support. Absolutely. And no offense. 
I understand. I, I don't quite understand. I mean, I, I don't I don't feel the need to have a phone call. We're we're not going to be able to do Skype. It's gonna it would be a conference phone call in council chambers. I think that seems very odd with this person. I mean, I don't have that need to hear from that person. Maybe you need to call her and talk to her, Judith. Um, I don't know. It wasn't just for me, and it wasn't just for the council. Council actually decided we were going to do this, as I recall. Um, but it's not just for us, it's for the community as we're trying to think with our community about how to do this. I mean, I have some specific concerns about the way it's currently conceived uh, in the job district description, but I was going to hold that off if we, I thought we had agreed we were going to do that. We were going to, we would like, it would be great to have someone come here, but the solution we came up with was since they would And who is this person? Distance. Who is the person that's going to come here? What Kate? Or call awesome. or do whatever? It is a contact that I had. Um, she used to be the president of the, the social work department. At where? From where? In the state? Illinois. 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 Okay. Illinois. So, it's, so they were at a distance. Uh, to me, even though it's a pilot project, even though we're calling it that, once we hire this person, we're making a real commitment. And I think we should do the due diligence um, to make sure our concept is the best that it can be. I guess one, you know, Yellow, we always say Yellow Springs is unique, which, I mean, every place is unique, <coughs> but we're so small that um, I do think that we have to find our own way, not that we don't want to take advantage of the resources that are out there ongoingly, but I, I guess I, I no longer, uh, having talked with the chief having read what's been written, I, I no longer feel a need to be having a consultation before we approve the position. I mean, it sounds like we're we're pretty far apart here. <laughs> I, you know, I don't know. Well, don't we know. haven't heard from two Cut. of us, so. Yeah, Go ahead. Jerry? I haven't heard from two. Uh, this will probably go on a little bit longer than I'm a council member. So I'm not going to, you know, I... <clears throat> my concern is giving up a, a, a uh, one of your positions and just reading the, the description, this person not be a police officer or would they be a police officer? Well, they would not. They would so not they're... they would not be. Then you know my concern is not about the budget. My concern is more about the safety of our officers and pulling a position away from our officers. Uh and also in the fact that, you know, we we struggle to have adequate coverage during the day and evening uh, as it is. Uh, given the support that the community would like to see from our department and some type of other specialists besides police officers, I think uh, the next council should really take a look at the budget uh, again, given that uh, the community is asking for more specialized uh, talent, but we also have an obligation to uh, protect the, the present citizens of the community, that uh, we may have to bite the bullet, bullet and, and, and increase. And, and, and this particular one, I don't think it should come out of the, the police department's budget. I don't know where it should come from, but it's, it's more of uh, this is a social action that the community wants and we feel we need. It's not a, I don't look at it as totally a public safety issue. So I don't think your, your budget should uh, bear the, the total brunt of this. 
Well, and actually, I, th I think that is an interesting point that Jerry brought up because when I thought about funding of this, I also thought about the fact that um, this is a village responsibility. I mean, the fact that we have uh, so many community type engagements uh, that are such a big part of <clears throat> what our officers now do. Um, so I guess where I'm at is I strongly support this. I do want to remind what we talked about a couple meetings ago that there, there is a sense of urgency that was expressed to us about this initiative uh, because officers without this expertise are, are filling in these gaps. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, and I like the idea as Marianne emphasized that this is not going to increase the budget. Um, so for me, I could accept this being decided at the next meeting, um, especially because we did not have this in the packet. So, you know, giving citizens an opportunity, I think it gives an opportunity to have a conversation with a police social worker. If we can't figure out the technology piece here, um, I'd be interested in being on that conversation as well. Um, but uh, I want to make a decision about this uh, before the end of the year. So. I agree. I mean, that's what. But I'm okay for waiting to the next meeting. Well, yes, I think we need to wait to the next meeting. But I think that that I would like to this to be something that we are able to to finish up in 2017 on my watch because this will be something that will that the new council will not be able to jump back into quickly. So if we don't resolve it, it's going to be another um, another relatively long time frame. So, um, Patty. Um, I, the only thing I would like to say is that if you are going to create this, this position as it stands, this description that you've read, does not currently exist, which means council has to create that position, which entails legislation. It, an ordinance? Um, Chris, it's an ordinance. Judy's nodding her head, yes. But um, that could be done as an emergency yes. at the next meeting. Right. So the only, I mean, we could prepare the legislation, and if council chooses to move forward, the legislation is there. If you choose to not move forward, then we just do not pass the legislation, if you would like. Well, and you also have the option of passing the legislation, creating the position without any description whatsoever, which puts the position in place and gives you time to flesh out how you want that to be funded or to look, but, but you could get the position at least onto the organizational chart. Yeah. And, and maybe if we, let's see, what are we calling it? What outreach specialist? Maybe if we add the word community or something, maybe that um, makes it makes it a little bit broader. Community outreach specialist or something. Maybe that makes the definition a little bit broader. I think we actually started with that, and and we must have lost that word somewhere along the way because I believe we originally were calling it that. But. Kate, do you have anything you'd like to add? Uh, nothing. No, nothing that I haven't already. Okay. Chief. Uh, Does, I, can I, I'd like to query Kate. And Would you be willing to come up? No. Well, I, I mean, I understand. I don't, I'm not exactly, of course, I'm not sure of your concerns, Judith, but it sounds like you're feeling that this description is different than what you originally thought. So I'm wanting to have feedback from Kate. Is what is being proposed what you think should make sense for Yellow Springs, given your research? Um, I, I do, because it hasn't been done here before, and we're a really small community, and the communities I spoke with were a lot larger, had three to four police social workers, usually. Sometimes there was one. Um, and like we said, it's a pilot project to make us oh, tailor yeah. it to this community and this department. So it doesn't, it, there are reasons that the chief has for why things are warded certain ways, different legalities, I think. And um, what are they? I'm comfortable with it. I mean, I'm comfortable. I support it. Um, if we're going to get into the details of it, for example, the second paragraph. So we were talking about a social worker. That's what was recommended. But mm -hmm. this applicant, the first thing it lists that it should they should expe possess experiences is in the area of criminal justice. 
and social services is added to that. That's a pretty different concept in my book. Um, I'm curious, so, you know, the kind of, so the kind of uh, social and uh, mental health issues, the kind of things that social workers with work, I mean, I know we want someone who understands the criminal justice system or at least can learn about it, but I don't think that should be their first, uh, that should be the first thing we should be thinking about at all. Right. Um, well, they're poli the ones who I've spoken with, their background is, it, is police social work. So that does take into account the criminal justice system. They need to have knowledge of that because they need to know which agencies they can work with and how they can... I understand that, but I guess I had understood it to be they understand because people who see social workers, people with opioid addiction, mental health issues, etc., end up and get involved with the criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. But I saw that their primary, um, my understanding was they had a master's in social work, correct? Yeah. We know we aren't going to be able to afford that, and right. I understand that. But a master's in social work with an understanding of the criminal justice system is different than someone who possesses experience first in criminal justice. Well, I, I don't think know it's, if it's... Well, that's the way I'm reading. That's the reason. That's the way I'm reading it because it's the first thing that's that's listed. And um, I think they need so, an understanding of it, definitely. Well, sure. They no. I I don't. I mean, that can be. It's from what direction are you you? Where do you start? And I think. Um, if we if we so change the order of those words, would that? I mean, work? I I. Want somebody who's closer to a social worker than this sounds to me, quite honestly. Um, but I, you know, I expected. I didn't find out till today we weren't going to be hearing from the social worker, so I expected that information to be part of our conversation tonight. So you know, all of a sudden we're making a decision almost without that piece of information, and I don't like it very much, quite honestly. Well, I will tell you when she's talked to me before, she has said that the social worker has to be a part of the police department. This is someone that works closely with the officers and with the public, but they essentially are a part of the team with the officers. Yeah, I understand so that. I understand I that, but it is I was imagining, uh, what is it? I think it is a social work position. I mean, I think a lot of what the officers do are also social mm -hmm. work positions. And I know Chief is committed to that. I just feel like we're going forward without having, I don't feel like we're have the, enough information to make a good decision. Okay. That's my position, but but if we bring it back and, you know, Brian and I can talk to someone, I had hoped the community could be a part of that. Um, I can and, and connect I, you to her. I mean, I think you have our contact information. Yeah. I know that you Right. I, I mean, what I would suggest is that council to. members who are interested in talking with that person contact that person. Mm -hmm. It's just too difficult to do in a council meeting. And she, she loves to talk about <laughs> I mean, she does. She's okay. very passionate. She's right. been doing it well, for 26 you. years. All right. So. That's fine. Thank you. Okay. And if I didn't, didn't say it, I also do think um, some thoughts about the job description would be good to bring back. So, um, so I, I agree with that in essence, but I guess I also appreciate how much our police department does in this realm of social work, and I want us to address that soon. Right. Chief Altman, do you have... Anything to add? Sure. Go. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> this, I mean, this would be a great first step. The system that we have in Greene County and in Ohio is a disaster, absolute disaster. We are taking people to hospitals who don't need to go to hospitals on a regular basis. The officers are doing the job of a psychologist, uh, you know, because the county contractor, frankly, is not up to the task. Uh, there are social workers who check a box and say, well, you've got a problem, you're going to the hospital. Uh, it's a bigger problem than just Yellow Springs. And it's something that we're going to try and address um, on the fire chief level because we're, you know, we, we see the error, the problem uh, in, in hauling people off to the hospital where they don't need to go uh, out of county. I'm not clear why you're hauling them there. Uh, because what you're talking about there. Uh, let's say uh, a resident has a, uh, a mental health problem. Uh, the police are called, TCN comes in as a county contractor, the social worker nine times out of ten, instead of taking them 
for therapy or to a crisis center, fills out a pink slip and says that they're a danger to themselves and others, and then they have to go to the hospital. Uh, TCN has a contract with Miami Valley, so we transport residents out of county to Miami Valley where they're assessed, and more often than not, Release they're back here before our ambulance crew is uh, in many situations. Mm -hmm. All it's doing is incurring costs for people. It's getting them out of county, out of the home. So this is a good first step. I mean, I think as a county, we all need to work together and convince the commissioners to do something better than what we're doing. But <laughs> that's easier said than done <laughs> to convince the commissioners of much of anything. Um, but this is definitely a good first step, and I think it's necessary. We have a very, you know, as a fire department, we have the highest percentage of mental health transports and patients of any department in the county. Mm -hmm. um, and that speaks to the nature of our, you know, accepting nature in this community, both the township and the villages. But, uh, but it's definitely a first step, I think, that'll be helpful and, and uh, hopefully get some of the burden off, off the officers because, you know, they've got a lot to do already, and they do it amazingly, you know, for all the crap that people like to talk about our officers here for not being social workers, they do a better job sometimes than a lot of the social workers do, so. But I think it's a good thing and, you know, it'll, it'll help. You know, once you guys figure out how you guys want to do it, but it'll definitely help the community and help the police department, so. Thanks, Chief. You're welcome. Sorry, yeah, no, also, yeah, Chief Carlson. Long conversation, uh, uh, but a couple things I wanted to, to point out real quick. Um, Judith, you know, I, I think you're right. I mean, I think it, we need to consider maybe flip-flopping the language because the blurb that I sent you guys today in my research from the National Association of Social Workers, um, the mission of the Association of Police Social Workers is to promote the development and practice of social work services that are provided within police department settings. So right there it's, I can see that language um, in reverse order. And, and Jerry, to your point, you know me, and um, I do see this as something that the police department can um, burden the budget, if you will, because the if this works, when and if this works, the repercussions will be um, amazing in the aid that officers can can receive in doing their job. Um, the other part about this article that I really liked was the 80-20 rule in policing. I'm not sure if you all had time to check it out, but please do when you can. 80% of our calls for service are social work of some kind. 20% are critical or police crisis. Um, but 80% of police training is critical police work and about 20 percent is crisis intervention social work training so m my dream is that this particular person once seasoned and you know part of the village family um, they will have an understanding of the mission that you have that you've entrusted me to facilitate and that will trickle into the overall fabric of the officers, you know, daily duties. We're there. We have a great group of people. We, um, it's just time. We need that extra set of hands that's not necessarily, you know, 100% from law enforcement. Thanks, Chief. So it's, it sounds like we have general agreement from the majority of council that we're ready to move forward on this at the next meeting. So what I would suggest is that Brian and Judith and Chief work on the job description, work on the fine tuning to get to a point where you're comfortable with that. Judy and Chris work on the resolution or the, the ordinance establishing the position and I would say potentially keeping it as minimal as possible just so it may not mesh, you know, just to make sure it meshes with this, however that works out. Um, do it as an emergency so we can get it done and just bring that all to the next meeting. Try to get it wrapped up. Thanks for your concern. Yeah, and I, I just want to say I really appreciate Chief. Uh, I really appreciate the leadership that Chief Carlson's bringing uh, to the department just in conversations that we've had, just how he interacts with our community. And 
your commitment to the, the social and mental health needs of the community, I really appreciate it. So my concern about this is not about that. I just want to be sure you knew that. But, um, but yeah, that sounds like a good plan, Karen. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. all. Um, Cresco facility update. You want to do it or you want me to do it? Um, well, I will at least, uh, hopefully everybody knows the, the news by now that it was announced uh, last Wednesday that um, Cresco was a successful uh, licensee. They did receive their license for a tier one uh, mar medical marijuana facility um, that will, will be built at the Center for Business and Education. And um, they are ready to break ground and um, we've been working, staff has been working diligently with them to get everything in line, uh, Chris, with the, with the uh, real estate transaction. Um, they will actually be in town later this week to work with the building department and work through some of the planning and zoning and building issues. Um, Next week, um, there will be a groundbreaking. We don't know when exactly yet, but there will be a groundbreaking at some point next week, and we'll make sure that we get that up on the Facebook page and on the, the website as quickly as we can, get that word out. Um, Patty, I don't know if you want, they're, they're very excited. They're, they're absolutely excited um, to be coming to Yellow Springs. I got the call at about 9.30 in the morning and, and uh, um, from, from Charlie Bachtel, so. Um, and we've been, you know, we've been getting some very positive press about it, and um, so we're excited for things to move forward. Uh, you pretty much said it all. Um, Cresco's coming into town later this week. We'll be working on hammering out um, some details, meeting with um, not only our staff, but uh, county building department and uh, Chris to, to hammer out the details of the sale of the property. Um, all of that kind of thing and then they'll be back next week for the ribbon cutting and uh, we'll make sure that we get a press release out on our website and Facebook page as well as asking Diane to do the ever diligent and wonderful thing that she does putting our press releases online. Great. So, so good news for uh, good news for Yellow Springs. Um, lodging tax implementation. I know Melissa will handle this. Um, Chris, I guess I should ask about what part of the what part of the conversation this is, and related to Marianne and I, can we remain in this discussion? Uh, there's no legislation. I think it's just an update on the project. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So I um, have been working to create materials. Um, that are both informational and um, some forms and such. So um, with the passage of the ordinance, um, there, there, there was a lot that needed to be done um, prior to January and then some more to be done prior to the first uh, reporting period, which is in July of 2018. So I created a page um, that's linked to the finance page I'm having major issues manipulating our website and I've been trying for probably two to three weeks to get somebody on the phone to help me um, from our uh, website uh, company that we use. They are very hard to get a hold of. Um, so some of the functionality is not optimal at this point, but um, it, um, there, there is information that's out there and um, so I just ask for everyone's patience because I am having technical difficulties. So if you go to our main page, um, if you go to yso.com, which I'm going to pull it up just so that, yeah, I could. That's probably a good idea. Okay, we're going to try to make this thing work. It's going to work. Let me see. And of course, my HDMI port is on the opposite side of where we need it to be. So do you want to switch seats? we are going to do some improvisation here. Okay. Is this working? Possibly. It will be. Any second. Okay. So if you go um, to Village Departments and you hover over it, and these, um, I, I know that this is crazy small. And you go down to finance, which is the third one down. There's a flyaway that comes out, and um, you'll see income tax, and underneath of that, you'll see lodging tax. If you click on lodging tax, it's giving an error, which is great. This is one of my issues. 
Um, so that's where once I get the functionality fully working properly, um, you'll be able to find it. But in the meantime, you can just click on finance. And then if you scroll down to the right, there's an area that says in this department. And then under that, you can actually navigate to the lodging tax page. That flyaway will direct you here. It works on some computers and it does not on others. The majority it does not work on, which is very frustrating for me. So um, we have the lodging tax page. Um, it gives some information about the ordinance that was passed and when it goes into effect. Um, there's a link where you can access the full ordinance. And then underneath of that, there's a uh, frequently asked questions uh, document that's two pages. Um, so it goes over um, what's considered a lodging establishment, where do I, what do I do uh, to start as an operator, um, who pays it, what is the rate, how do I pay it, when is it due, what happens if I'm late, who's exempt, how can I pay, where do I mail my payment. Um, so there's a lot of uh, information there on that page. Um, frequently asked questions. So then um, we've got the permit application which is where everything is going to start. So we have a print version of the permit application which is here and um, the fee is not listed on here because uh, we realized in the in the um, zoning code that there was not um, a fee um, that made sense for this so there's legislation at the next meeting to come in to change that in order to add this permit fee to that um, fee schedule. And I don't remember where we landed with that. I think it's going to be $25 um, for the permit application fee. So it's not listed on here because that's still one of the things that we need to hammer out at the next meeting, but it will be. I will have that information. I'll update the application with that. And then the uh, second thing which I really worked hard to try to make work and we, we are having some issues with functionality. Um, we have the ability to have online forms on our website and that they're submitted and routed to the appropriate person. Um, it's really cool when it works because um, you'll get a tracking number and in that, with that tracking number um, you can actually figure out where you're at in the process. Um, and this would be shot immediately to Denise. I know that um, Karen had filled one out and it didn't, I think that she got an error. Um, so I'm, I'm still working on the functionality of this. Um, but if you click on it, so if anybody tries to use this, um, I know that, I think Karen, you were doing it from a mobile device, wasn't it? I think it? possibly, yeah. So, I don't know if that was part of the issue. Um, I had tested it and it seemed to work from a computer. So there is the lodging per transient lodging permit application that is here and um, you would be able to submit that and it goes straight to Denise and then you would just have to pay the fee, um, which we don't have a way to submit the fee online. Um, so you could just uh, drop a check in the mail to, to Denise once we have that permit fee established. So if anybody tries to do this, please call Denise um, in Planning and Zoning and make sure that she had received it. Um, I'm going to make it a priority next week to, uh, if I have to call every single person in our website's organization to try to make all these Yeah, I was just going to say, um, let's talk in the morning and I'll call eGov. I'm having, I mean, I put in a help ticket and I'm, okay. I'm having major problems. They're just not responsive. Yeah, I'll talk to them. Um, so... We've got the permit application there and then um, at the very bottom we just have some information that talks about registration, that just the steps that are involved. You'll register, you'll get approval and an official certificate and then you'll need to report and then the documentation and filing. And then it's got Denise's email there, she starts the process and then I kind of finish it off with the, uh, the tax collection piece. So. Um, that's what I have so far. Um, there is obviously a big piece of this missing, which is going to be your, uh, your tax remittance piece. Um, so once I get the bugs worked out with this online uh, form situation, then the form for the reporting and submission of the and filing of the taxes will be finished, and then I will also have that online. So I'm hoping um, in, at the beginning of January, because um, the holidays are just a really hard time to get people together, but 
Towards the beginning of January, I would like to have um, a couple of different informational sessions, um, maybe one during the day, one during the evening, one on a weekend, um, just so that we can try to capture as many people as possible where they could come in. I can kind of run everybody through the process that's interested. They would have time to ask questions, possibly turn in their permit forms, um, and get, uh, get everything kind of uh, the ball kind of rolling at it, it, it a one-stop shop. So Denise would be there, I would be there, and then we would be able to um, we would be able to do this in probably an hour. So we don't we don't want to bore people with details, but we also want to be able to present what we've got and then give the people ability to ask questions and things. So as all of this is kind of coming online and um, becoming uh, active with this this tax and this ordinance and enacting the whole thing I'm definitely more than willing to take recommendations suggestions um, any way to make it easier I know that um, one of the things that was stressed when I was at the ICMA I went to a, a short-term rental um, session was that make sure that you have that people are able to submit online make sure that it's um, mobily enabled too which I think is an issue for us which I'm hoping eGov will be able to help us because they said that you know the, the the numbers are kind of staggering the people that are submitting taxes via a uh, mobile device so we want to try to make this as easy as possible for people um, and I do want to reiterate the fact I know that a lot of there was a lot of confusion regarding what we were going to require I definitely do not want every single receipt that's ever been collected um, by uh, by lodging establishments um, I just need summary information as to what was receded in and the tax so it's going to be a one-page form and it's just the the ordinance is written in a fashion that if we would ever need to look at any kind of receipts or anything to do an audit that those would be available to us i don't want individual receipts from every single establishment um brought in in july and kind of plopped down so um, with that being said, that's that's basically um, the work that I have done. Um, outside of that, I know that there was uh, discussion about voluntary tax collection Actually, agreements. Actually, Melissa, before we get into that, because I think there'll be more of a discussion, um, one thing I wanted to point out with the FAQs is, I, and I think I'm right about this, but Chris, correct me if I'm wrong, under exempt it needs to be uh, government employees when they're um, when it's part of their work and so I think we should clarify that okay right I, I can't just go to Florida and get that discount but um, but I if I'm you know if, if it's for you know I'm going to a conference or something it's about the official business. yes thank you yes okay I will okay. definitely clarify that and then I just want to say, so awesome that we're doing the online forms. Mm -hmm. If I can just, get it to work, it's going to be amazing. We will. <laughs> yeah, it's that's going to be a big it, game. It changer. took it took me probably two days of toying around with the the back end of the website to try to make it work because it's not user friendly. Um, and I I was really proud of myself for figuring it out. So if we can get it to work, it's going to be great. Cool. But anyway, sorry to interrupt about okay. the agreements. Okay. Does anybody else have any um, feedback or questions um, as it relates to the informational materials that are on the website at, at present? I, I, I really have a question about your comment about the, the difficulty in getting in touch with our tech people. Is that a common? Not tech it's people. not our tech people, yeah. Oh, it's it's the, a different. The website <laughs> okay. hosting um, okay. organization that All we right. use. Okay. Yeah. Um, I guess the only thing I would like to say, and, and you may have addressed this, mm -hmm. I'd rather there not be quite so many drop downs. I mean, if you could make it a little bit, I don't, I don't know that it's necessarily intuitive that somebody goes to the finance department that goes under departments. So maybe it goes under the, that, that sidebar of, there's the sidebar about on the main page, the emerge or the, the, fast answers or something like right. that find it fast, find it fast. Up to the top, I, think. I mean I think it should go where you're saying but it needs to go somewhere I else can, because it's yeah. not at all intuitive yeah in in trying to manipulate this yeah trying to add a new one to that I don't know how to do that okay um, well but but definitely whatever you do there is fine but definitely include it in the find it fast yeah I can do that I can do that 
Any other comments or well, okay, are we, the agreements? Or? Yeah. Do you want to talk about the um, Airbnb agreements? Um, yeah. There is um, so Airbnb. When we when we talk about short term um, or transient guest lodging, there there are I think over 120 websites, which was quoted to me, and that number grows every day. Um, but Airbnb is one of the the bigger the bigger brands um, in the game. So they actually um, have something that's called a uh, voluntary tax collection agreement. And from my understanding, um, Judy, I'll go ahead and give this back to you. It's from my understanding that the whole reason that Airbnb um, created this voluntary tax collection agreement was a workaround in response to San Francisco's opposition of Airbnb. So they said, hey, we'll, t we'll collect taxes for you. How about you let us into your city? So um, this voluntary tax collection agreement that Airbnb has um, is basically a municipality will enter into an agreement with Airbnb um, in order for them to collect taxes on the municipality's behalf and then remit those to the municipality. Um, in doing research on this, um, where, it, where it all kind of started, I had never heard of it until I went to that ICMA session on uh, short-term rentals and transient guest lodging. And they, they came out very strongly and said, we absolutely um, dissuade municipalities from entering into this type of agreement because there are lots of transparency issues with it. It's, it's, it's got a lot more problems than what it does benefits to it. Um, and it was funny because Denise had sent me a text while I, right after I'd left that that said, hey, can you look into, or can you look into voluntary tax collection agreements? So it was actually very timely. Um, so then I began doing some research on my own outside of that um, and there were two different documents that I had found which I, I was going to include them in the packet but I just included the links. Um, but there was one that I thought was interesting. It's a 55 page report on, on these voluntary tax collection agreements and it was put out by the, um, the American Hotel and Lodging Association. And it, it strongly um, opposes these types of agreements as well. So it was a very, um, very extensive research report. And I, I gave uh, some bullet points in my report that's in the packet um, that were the main points as to why these aren't good ideas. Um, and then finally, on Airbnb's website, they actually have um, they have a list of people in Ohio that are doing this. And out of all of the counties and all of the municipalities in the state of Ohio, only Cuyahoga County and the city of Cleveland have entered into these. So I think that that shows that this is definitely not the trend in which municipalities are falling, following. So. I did, I was asked to look into voluntary tax collection agreements because it was thought that it might make reporting easier for um, some of our operators that utilize Airbnb. And I'm finding it's, it's, it's more problematic than it is beneficial. So it's my recommendation that we not enter into that type of an agreement with Airbnb. And I'd just like to add that I, I agree with Melissa on all of the things she said, but I would also like to point out that if someone advertises on more than just one site, if they advertise on Airbnb and then they advertise on it, I don't even know what another site is because I've never used it. But then they have to collect for whatever bookings they get on that site, but not on the air. It may actually make it more difficult for people because now you have to remember what came through Airbnb and what came through one of the other sites. Right. And or, so it, or a separate website. Right. Mm -hmm. So it may actually make it more complicated for people if we do it that way. I mean, that would just be what my initial reaction would be. And then after seeing the research that Melissa has done and talking to her about it, I, I have to agree with her that this is probably not something that we want to do. Um, this is something I had raised, and I think to, with Denise, and uh, because I found it on the uh, Airbnb, they have a, a tools kit 
Um, and obviously they're responding to concerns by municipalities. Um, they're, they're trying to meet the needs of municipalities because they want to be able to operate there. <laughs> so they're trying to, and they're trying to find the cutting edge, you know, to make, if they can make things easier, that, you know, for the operator, for the people, you know, whose homes are being shared, et cetera, uh, and they're making, and the municipalities are getting their taxes, then everybody's uh, might be happier. So that's part of their competitive edge that they're trying to go for. The hotel, you know, the 55 page study that was done, you know, it's their competitors basically. Uh, but is it the right thing to do? I don't know, but I did do a little bit of research myself and I think it's something we should look into because, um, and I think, I don't know, I mean, when you, when you rent, I, I don't know how many of these other, if, if any of these other short-term rentals or Airbnb type uh, organizations, you know, if, if some of the others have this possibility as well, I don't know that, but I think it would be worth us looking into. I found an article in Fortune Mag Magazine, um, and it basically, there are 20 states in the, in the United States who have signed an agreement with Airbnb, and they claim that half of their renter, rentals um, are under these agreements uh, in the country. So, to me, the main purpose, the main reason I would like to think about it, I don't know if it's the right thing, I think we need to do some research, like it might be useful to call Cleveland, find out, you know, what's their experience been, um, is that for that percentage of short-term rentals in the village or transient visitor lodging in the, in the village, we know we're getting the taxes and it takes all the burden off the village. It automatically happens when people book it takes the burden off of the, you know, lodging the, the host as well. Um, Except if the if the host has multiple. Yes, sites. no, I understand. You'd have to you'd have to pay attention to that. But my sense is Airbnb really does dominate that market. But maybe yeah. I'm wrong. We get fifty percent. Fifty. Okay. We're, we're half. So fifty. So fifty percent. So given the breadth of the market, that's still significant. I don't know if it's the right thing to do, but I do think it's worth uh, looking into. Um, and so that's what I would like to suggest is that, um, I mean, I would think we would want some legal advice on it and that we look to, you know, municipalities that are using to have the agreement, you know, major cities, most of them do have these agreements. There's no way they would collect any of, the, hardly any of that. I mean, you know, the, their ability to monitor it all. And I know it was one of the concerns of staff as well. So I just think it's worth looking into it. I, I wonder if it doesn't make sense though. Everything is set up. It's, this is going to start, the collection is going to start, the requirement to start collecting is yes. going to start January 1 of 2018. Right. The first check is going to be due by the lodging locations July 1 of 2018. Right. I wonder if it doesn't make sense to potentially do a year, get through 2018 as it is before looking to implement a different well, we don't even know if we want system. to. We right. don't even know if it makes so, sense. So that which, which says to me that it's probably something that, you know, you're not suggesting that anything be held up. We're going to. I'm not. Well, we're not going to hold anything up because it's right. starting in January. But um, if it's making things easier for 50 percent of what you do, and some people it might be all of what they do. I don't know. Um, and maybe some of these other services do it as well. I don't know. That's the kind of research I think would be useful to do. Um, I agree with Judith. I think we should reach out to Cleveland and Cuyahoga County just to you know, get some idea of, of why and um, I, I guess for me, and I'm not in this business, but I would imagine you get an accounting from Airbnb, you get an accounting from each of those services. So I, I would just like to understand why it would be more complicated a little bit more. And again, I don't want to hold anything up, but uh, I did talk to Bob Sweeney about this. He thought it was a good idea, not that he knows all of this information. So I just want to make sure, similar to what Judith is saying, is that um, we, we we keep on figuring out, you know, or well, we figure out for sure. 
why it's yeah. bad. Well, and, and I, I want to hear more about the, the concern over this agency collecting our taxes. That's exactly the point mm -hmm. I was getting ready to make. We're asking a private company that does not have to adhere to the same public records laws that we do as a municipality. We're asking a, a private entity to collect taxes on behalf of a public entity. That but but that happens all the time, doesn't it? I mean, when we go into a store, we pay taxes to a private entity that then goes to. I mean, I don't see the. I'm not. I'm not trying to be difficult. I just. I don't see the difference. That's what you know. I've read what you said, and I didn't quite understand what's the difference between that and you go and buy a taxable thing and you pay it to the, you know, the uh, store, um, and and then it's they collect it for the state and the feds and whoever they collect I, it. For. I will say that uh, I don't think the village is going to get rich off of the local Airbnbs. Like I figured out how much I would be paying. Oh, right. I mean, hundred and twenty-five, hundred and fifty dollars something. So I don't think it's worth hours and hours of staff time for the several thousand dollars. It's probably going to come in from Airbnb. I agree. Unless our lodging establishments think it could help them, so that's that would be a reason why I would at least want to consider. But I, I don't and, think and, you have to invest a lot of time. And while Bob said it's a good idea, did he say it was a bad idea to not do it? We didn't have a large conversation. About, okay. I mean, I think, but I, I think we should, you know, just make sure that we understand. But I, I to me, it should be relatively easy either way. Um, I mean, I guess that's where... I thought it would make it easier for the staff, quite honestly, and for us to, you know, and it, like I say, if there's other places that we can do similar things, I don't know. Uh, it might it will be, make the collection easier and we can make sure people are adhering to that well, for it, that percentage. You know, Judith, I, I, and I'd like to ask Melissa a question about something you just said. You said that you thought it would make it easier for staff and and... I can see where you would think that because now you're getting, you know, one from Airbnb. And but my question for Melissa was, if you're getting this bulk payment from Airbnb and they're saying, I mean, I don't know that they do or don't list specific well, they must. individual places when they do that. Mm -hmm. um, I guess that would be one of my questions because yeah. then you're going to get something from say, you know, if Mary Ann submits something to you and says, I had this many bookings on Airbnb, so that's already collected, and then I had this many bookings on other websites, and here's my tax, then you have to, you have to reconcile those mm -hmm. as Mary Ann's establishment. Mm -hmm. You mean unbundle it or whatever? Mm -hmm. Yeah. If it all comes uh, together? So I guess... I mean, that, that I could see being an issue. Yeah, so I mean, I don't know that Airbnb does or doesn't tell... Yeah. I would assume that they probably would give an itemized statement. But that might make it more complicated for staff, actually. But the other, the, the issue that is, that is a potential positive for the village is that um, our system is, de is dependent upon these people registering. Compliance. Airbnb, Compliance. if you're on Airbnb's website, if you're on their platform, they're going to pay it. They're going to take it out of, just like they take out their percentage, they're going to take out this 3%. I think one question I would want to ask them is do they charge, is there a fee? Do they take a fee, an additional fee out to do that? So check that out. But so so. Melissa, in order to get all of these people registered, Melissa and or Denise are going to have to start making phone calls. I mean, they're going to have to go on the Airbnb website and they're going to have to figure out who all these people are if they're not voluntarily filling out an application. Which everybody has uh, 30 days after the uh, legislation or the ordinance is enacted, so that means that everybody would have until the end of January in order to register. So just as a reminder. Okay. Any citizen input, Jim? Okay. Um, are we ready to move on? Yeah, and Melissa, I do want to say thanks for researching this. Yeah, lots um, of work. No problem. Because I, I know it is a marketing tool that they're using, and so, mm -hmm. yeah, so I just want to... Um, next is complete streets policy. That is uh, Brian's work. Uh, so this 
is a draft and it we tried to get the draft watermark but for some reason it wouldn't work um, so what I will say is uh, if we think back to what a complete streets policy is about it is essentially to make sure that in all our decisions when we're working with roads and everything else in the village we think about all users on our streets and making sure that young, old, all, just all abilities um, are able to use that. Um, I will say that I largely base this on the Miami Valley Regional Planning Commission award-winning complete streets policy. Uh, so I didn't feel like we needed to recreate the wheel. Um, it's a very flexible kind of policy. It doesn't create any mandates. You have to do this. It just reminds us for every project that we think about it at the beginning. Um, one piece that uh, I've asked for the Active Transportation Committee to help us with is the at the very end when it talks about performance measurement. Um, and honestly, I just didn't have the time to fully think that out. Um, but otherwise, I think it's a it's a good document. I think it fits the village, um, and uh, if possible, since everyone on this council has been through uh, the workshop and the, the you know sort of information around this, it would be nice to wrap this up if we still agree with it in principle. Um, so I don't have to. I have a lot to say otherwise. I mean, I think it's a pretty straightforward, basic kind of concept. Where, where would this policy be housed? And would it be part of the comp planning plan? Mm -hmm. Comp plan, comp plan, planning commission. Um, you know that that's where it would be. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what 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 Brian are you asking us to approve it? Tonight, I would assume it would what? be a resolution. <laughs> no, Re Chris, would this be approved by resolution, adopted as a um, policy? I, I would think we would adopt it by resolution. That's what we did in MVRPC. I'm sure that that's what we want to do. So I suggest. If you take formal action for this one, right? Yes, I suggest we bring a resolution to the next meeting. Okay. And yeah, and the only thing that I think will just be fleshed out a little bit is that that last little section about measuring success. But otherwise, I think it's there. Thanks. Um, and you and Marion have the next one, the Board and Commission Policy Review. Well, Brian is the one that put this together. I, I have I've started working on something trying to consolidate at least my thinking about this. Basically, I'm thinking all these things are sort of like the skeleton for our commissions. They're not really the real work of the commission. But I haven't fit finalize what I'm putting together and I also wanted to have the new council have this be part of the new council discussion and council retreat discussion so I, that's all I have to say at this point. yeah I mean the only thing I'll I'll just I wanted to make sure to highlight since uh, Judith and Marion were not at the last meeting um, what is in the packet that we discussed last time um, one of the things that I think is uh, a really good suggestion here is that our clerk manage the interview process so that it's we've got a public record of that and everything else. Um, and then I, I think the other thing that Judy brought up that I thought was a great idea is to make sure we understand EEOC guidelines in our interviewing process. Um, and then, and Judy, you even mentioned that we could do like a mini training about that, right? Yeah, and those guidelines can go out too when the interviews are set up that just goes to the council reps who are conducting the interviews just so you've got it front and center, but certainly training, training can occur. And, and are you and Marianne going to be working on the, um, some of those the statements, what we'll yeah, the things the, uh, that public official values. Yes. Um, yes. So I think uh, I agree with Mary Ann, and this means one topic we don't have to go in depth on tonight is that I initially I thought we should have this all figured out before the new council, but I've changed my mind. I think it's fine to, um, you know, we've we've got a good framework, and so we can work on some of the nuts and bolts and best practices. Uh, at the beginning of the year. 
It sounds good. Well, are you are you guys okay with the guidelines, or are you passing those along forward? If I can go with these as a, you've agreed with them up to this point, we'll go with that's how the interviews will happen, and we'll go ahead and work on EEOC guidelines, that kind of thing, if you're okay with that. Otherwise, I guess it reverts to how it was prior to. Are you asking about the role of, where it says role of, well, okay. Got well, it. both documents yes, were updated okay significantly. So, but what's bolded on the uh, guidelines is the part is what's changed. We should probably adopt it just so there isn't a time period of delay. I mean, what if there's what if there's an open position and we don't have this? Yeah, I, there is an open I think uh, I, I'm comfortable with what we've got here in principle um, and then the, so. and then that roles and responsibilities document that's maybe the one that could be updated mm -hmm. potentially I mean I think that there was I brought up that I felt like there was it was a little too broad that the, yes. that that big spreadsheet seemed a little too broad yeah and we definitely probably wanna, be more specific right we want to customize that um, we want to make sure that there's kind of a simple best practices list or just kind of you know just kind of the high uh, high level things that need to happen almost like a checklist um, and then we're going to take out the treasurer thing out of the ordinances we talked about that um, so these two pieces of paper that that were presented tonight these guidelines with a number of of recommendations for changes and the board and commission applicant process it seems important that we do get these in place because i think it's pretty much what Council agreed to um, at the last meeting and, and concerns that have been expressed by Judith previously about how the process has been happening. Well, and these aren't new, right? Well, yeah, because this is some little. I mean, but there. I mean, there are some revisions, but these are practices that we had even before my time on council. Well, some of the, remember, well, no, Brian, some of the stuff. the advertising and that was a little more clarifying. Yeah, right? I mean, we tightened yeah, that up. We tightened that up. Um, <coughs> And we tightened up this, you know, piece about the interviewing process. Right. But I, I guess I am, am I right, Judy, that this was an existing policy yeah. document, right? That, that's all I mean. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I was going to say maybe if the new council is going to be looking at commission stuff, um, the EEOC thing, may, maybe the uh, if there's some kind of guidelines that are short and to the point. The council, the new council, could look at them and decide: Do we want a little training, or is it adequate just to review what they are? I'm just. I'm just mm -hmm. I think training is always a great thing. I do. Well, I know, but I'm just saying that the that council could look at the new council could look at. It would be good to you know look at that and decide to, if we want to do that. Right. That doesn't have to be part of this. I am just asking that just so we have firm a firm process in place mm -hmm. that we. I'll make a motion that we adopt the guidelines for council, for commissions, committees, and boards, and the board and commission applicant process. Okay. Second. I just, sorry. Um, I, I just. Was that a. Were you, I made a motion. Well, I said. Oh, did you want to. Well, just because there's, there's one small change we need to make. I, um, I, I'd rather go over this because I didn't see this until this weekend. Um, I mean, Brian and I thought that we bring it to the next council meeting. <coughs> I just don't want it hanging out well, there. I mean, and I understand when it comes to the specific the, roles and responsibilities. Well, we're under the and current rules until these two well, anything new. You just made a motion, and I seconded it. Oh, right? <laughs> true. Okay. All right. Um, all those in favor, sign what what change you what change needs to be made? Uh, the second document and the third bullet. Um, is, we need to fix this uh, that the clerk will uh, let them know when a council member will be contacting them for an interview because again we've said that the clerk is going to do that I, I did change that no well, it's not the, in the packet it's yeah. I remember we talked about it before but yeah I'm looking at then I must not have understand what you meant because I, I it says disseminate names and resumes to the to council the rep as they come in the clerk will immediately follow up with the candidate to provide further information to let them know that a council member will be contacting oh you're right you're right right yeah okay so um, just that just that you're doing it and, so. 
And I'd like to point yeah, out again, yeah. it's the same thing as the ordinance for the community outreach specialist position. You can have the resolution and it ready for the next packet and if council chooses not to pass the resolution. I don't even think yeah, we need a resolution. To me, this is a motion. It's this a motion. is a motion that this, this, these will be yeah. the practices that will be followed until council, the new council sure. maybe decides something else. I just don't want there to be ambiguity for a couple of months period of time because it's been an issue. So all those in favor signify by saying aye. Uh, aye. aye. Opposed. So it passed three to, do we get three ayes? Four, four, four to four eyes. Okay. Come on. Um, and then Mary Ann um, or Patty, who wants to update in the housing needs assessment? Um, uh, well, the update uh, for Bowen is in your packet that shows the status so far, um, as council knows, we were originally supposed to have uh, Bowen present next meeting, um, the final report, and we have moved that to the January 2nd meeting, and the reason that we did that was because they were not going to have the draft to us, uh, to the working committee, until the 16th of December, and that was not enough time for us to turn this around in a timely manner and make sure that we got constructive comments back to them for revisions. And so they will still be getting us the draft um, in mid-December, uh, around the 13th to the 16th. We will have, uh, you know, uh, up until about Christmas, so that's 10 to 12 days, for the uh, working group to review that, go back and forth with comments and revisions. And then by the time we hit Christmas, um, we should have everything to Bowen so that they can work on the final report and make that presentation before council on January the 2nd. Um, the report that's in your packet, I asked them since they were not going to be presenting if they could provide us with this update. Uh, and this is where they stand so far. They are still, um, they still have a couple of additional follow-up stakeholder interviews to do um, next week, I believe those are scheduled for. And, um, but you can see pretty much where they stand on the data collection. We had an enormous number of surveys response, survey responses, 581 resident survey responses, and 26 stakeholders uh, responses, which is really good. So. Um, and they, uh, I remember we talked about doing that check to make sure they were representative, those the surveys, and so they, um, yes, we sent that to them and they are trying to make sure to look at the different demographics and things and, and just determine that it is representative of our, of our population. But I will double check on that. I sent them that email. Okay. So um, I'd like to state my concern that um, one, that I think it's very important for the housing working group, which includes staff, Karen, myself, and uh, Liz Voigt and Karen Magruder, not only, pardon, Kevin, 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 Kevin Magruder, um, not only to have time to thoroughly read it and provide feedback, but that if we see something in the report that we think is not understandable, or that we see something in the re don't see something in the report that we think is important that we have, that we give Bowen adequate time to make changes that we think are important before we make the, before the final report comes to council. Uh, there have been reports that have come to council, I think, that after the fact we've said, gee, well, why, why didn't we get this? Or, or um, you know, a group that's working on it says, well, we don't agree with this. Or we haven't gotten reports and, and are we getting them piecemeal? So I just, this is so important that I, what, I guess my main point is, if there were something to be found by the working group that we agreed upon, we wanted to be changed, however that would be, that, we, that I think it's important to give Bowen enough time to do it, and that holiday period of time is not, for most of us, an ideal time to be working on things. All, I guess all I'm saying is that if it, if it ta takes till the second meeting in January, 
or maybe the beginning of February, I don't know. I'd rather wait and have the report meet our needs than have something come in that we're going, oh, well, I'm this. just wondering, given the new council's coming on the first meeting in January, if it makes sense to just wait to the second meeting. I agree. I just think this is too, mm -hmm. too meaty. This is to, very meaty, that, you know, we're yeah, going to be doing. I would, I, would, I would definitely put it off until mm -hmm. the second meeting if, if Patrick can do it. I'll, I'll ask him. I mean, the, you know, I've... I asked him about the second because that was where we thought we were going to move it to. So um, I'll have to ask him if he's available on the on the uh, where would that be the fifteenth, uh, sixteenth, fifteenth. Yeah. But we clearly don't have any time to back it up to give it more time because he's already said he's going to be done, you know, mid September or mid December. So. Um, yeah, I my, my concern is that we send it to the working group and they put it aside because it's the holiday, and they don't get to well, it. Well, but the then if it's we can then if it's January, so I mean, but I, 16th, I, that's well, a like, big deal. I'd like to make a decision because Marianne then said, and maybe even the first meeting in February. So I'd kind of like to make a firm decision instead of continuing to change. Well, day, so. I, I mean, I don't imagine that we're going to have a major thing, but if we did have a major thing, right. I'd rather be able to be flexible about that. So well, why don't we tentatively say the second meeting in January, if, if Pat Bowen can come to that, and then our group can set up a time that we're going to get together probably two times, one to initially talk maybe, and then another time after we've read the, the reports and I mean, we can set up a process for our working group to be timely. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will uh, email them tomorrow and see if they can move it to the second meeting. Thank you. So the second meeting will be January 16th because Mon Monday, January 15th is yeah. oh. MLK Day. So. Yeah. Okay, um, well, I think we're on the staff reports. I do not have a report because I was on vacation. Okay, um, Melissa. There is nothing earth shattering in my report. Um, basically, the Zemi Avenue CDBG project um, is finished. All of that's complete. Um, safe routes to school still in progress, and I'm doing end of year budget stuff, beginning of the year budget stuff. So Sounds that's exciting. it for me. Chief. We're good. Okay. Oh. <laughs> yeah. We're in the process uh, for promoting our our new corporals, and the department is testing for two full-time officers. We have 15 applicants. We'll be uh, oh. doing the written test and the physical on December 16th. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Clerk? Um, just a orientation will take place this week, December 7th and 8th. The schedule is attached. Uh, orientation for new council members and schedules attached for your interest. Um, PD's been given a lot of bike lights and I'm working with Mills Lawn and the high school to try to get them to hand things out, especially coaches and stuff when kids are getting ready to leave practice, make sure some people have lights on their bikes. So we're still pushing that and other than that, kind of business as usual. Fine. Um, Judy, are we going to go over the commission, the meeting? Board. No. Okay. Take it home. Look at it before you go to bed because that's what you'll want to do and then uh, get back to me. No problem. Judy, quick question. Do we have a PC rep for the lunch on the 8th? Planning nope. And you're not likely to get one. There's just absolutely no one available. Okay. Jerry and Judith aren't available? Who are they? Well, you're coming to the lunch, but he'll be at the lunch. I and mean, we, we well, specifically he... push the, the representatives from the the citizen members it was supposed of the board of commissions, members. and we're not going to get that. Oh, you wanted commission. someone just to right. We wanted one from each commission, just oh. to, so that's the only one we have. Not. Pat is coming, by the way, from JST. Yeah. So I mean, I if you, if you don't have one, you then when there is the ability, or if there is a talk about discussion about planning commission, then you could handle that. If there isn't somebody there to talk about it, and. Is there going to be a go-around or something? Yeah, there's just a, a go-around what okay. who you are, what you represent, and then folks that get a, an opportunity to just chat. Okay, okay. Um, next meeting, December 18th. Woohoo! <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Are you excited? Yes. Wow. Um, Jerry. 
know, you really look sad, Karen, because you're sad. <laughs> Next meeting. Was that a fist bump? Were you guys doing a fist bump? bump? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you think I didn't say anything to him? <laughs> Um, okay, so we've got obviously all of this housekeeping stuff on. Um, we, we are starting with the executive session at 5.30 to do a review of the council clerk. Um, we added a resolution for the complete streets policy and, and I, we will, it sounds like we're going to have potentially uh, legislation for um, outreach coordinator. And then you've got the support of the Yellow Springs Clifton Connector resolution. Yeah, that's, oh, yeah. oh, no, I thought we were, oh, yeah. Do we did that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, resolution, you're right. Mm -hmm. And I do have something else to add to. Um, we're going to need an ordinance for uh, transfers because, um, oh. yeah, I, I didn't think about it until the last minute. So we will have to have an Approving. ordinance author authorizing transfers. Order transfers. Yes, yes. And then um, the, revol the revolving loan fund implementation, is that just going to be a discussion? Because um, I know that we had talked um, in agenda planning before about just how complicated that has started to be in the timing. I, staff just hasn't had time to okay. work to get to working on that. Um, yeah, if I, yeah, I think a discussion would be appropriate. Well, how, so you leave the discussion on? Yeah, I mean, if you want. I mean, no legislation. Right, right. We, we'll leave the discussion on then. That would, I mean, that would at least move, keep moving it along. I think that's, mm -hmm. that's our, the concern is to just keep it, the discussion moving forward. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. Okay. Um, and then we've got, did we decide we need to do something with the nominating petition? That should be on oh, okay. there, yeah. Resolution okay. approving Village Council of Mayor nominating position. Is it on there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. are, we doing oh. are we doing taser policy? Uh, GSTF would like to bring the citation and warning report. Oh, so now so wait, I wait, think wait, we should do that instead of the other one. So we're doing, so probably doing one. We're doing which one? The citation and warnings report. Okay. I just want to make sure the voluntary collection agreement discussion that's coming back, when, you know, that that gets on a future, that it just gets on the list. I know it won't be for that meeting probably. Chris, did you have something you wanted to add? To clarify, uh, we've got a resolution approving the village council and mayor nominate the petition. Uh, Judy, I hadn't looked into that whether it should be a mm -hmm. or a resolution. Did you talk to uh, uh, the board of I, I mean, we're, char we're, we're a charter community, so we sort of can do, I don't th think that they would weigh in on that. Um, I don't see any reason it wouldn't be able to be just a resolution. We're doing a smoking thing. It's, I mean, it's policy level, but it was my thinking. So let's look at the signage, okay. look at the graphics. Cool. And just, Brian just brought up the designated smoking areas. Are we, we're just talking about just presenting the signage and the graphics? Well, council also asked me to give specific locations where there would be smoking and where there would not be smoking. So okay. Johnny and I are gonna drive around and do specific, and I'll have a report plus the signage graphic. And I'll, well, I, I worked on um, a, an informational card, a rack card cool. type thing that would go um, at each of the sign locations. So I'll have we'll have samples of that, and maybe it might be might not be it might be nice. I'd like to if we could even mock up the sign only because I'd like to have an understanding of what size it is and a piece of cardboard or something. We Similar. can get that we can get that done over at uh, Spark Place at the Xenia Library. Ooh, there you go. Um, motion to adjourn. Move second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 aye.